Well, hello, everybody. Well, hello. How are you doing, bud? I'm doing okay, buddy. How about you? Good, good, good. Hey, it just struck me, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the list of people that are joining us now on a regular basis. You know, we've got an audience from pretty much from coast to coast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last week, we had folks from BC right down to uh, Nova Scotia. I don't think we had Newfoundland on last week. We had Newfoundland on the week before. We had... Um, We've also had Australia on, right? We've had uh, Australia, yeah. Australia. So yeah. If, uh, there's a Toronto guy there right now. No, oh, Dar Darlene, yeah. Greg Al. Okay. And so how fitting cool. uh, that today our guest is from California. Uh, yes. He'll be joining us here momentarily uh, to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons, as you'll find out here shortly. Yeah. Uh, before we do that, just want to. Uh, Welcome, everybody, uh, to the program. Uh, we're getting kind of comfortable doing this stuff now. I don't know what's going to happen when we when we won't. Well, you know what? Maybe it'll make them uh, make, make our nice audience want us even more. You never know, right? Maybe they're maybe they're kind of getting tired of us already. You guys getting tired of us? No. Aww, maybe, me. <laughs> maybe me. Maybe <laughs> me. I'll tell you what. With this subject matter today, it'll be Angelo and the doctor more than it will be me because uh, uh, it's, uh, although I've listened and uh, you know learned a little bit about it and has been on the Lyme disease uh, subject on his radio show so many times you know what I mean and from from the inception of the first time he brought it on the doctors wanting to beat his head in because they're thinking it's all bogus shit to, to now uh, you know they're they're saying okay maybe we should spread the word so never forget the very first phone call I took and I don't know how many years ago it was but very first phone call I took uh, from a doctor who wanted to speak to me live on air about the subject that week, and I was talking about Lyme disease. And I had I had Catherine, um, yeah, Catherine yeah. Maroon. Maroon. Yeah. yeah, right. And she, of course, was one of the very first celebrities to get Lyme disease, um, and it it was she, she had a hell of a time with it. But anyways, I had her on the show, and we're talking about it, and and when and this doctor comes on, and he was just irate. <laughs> He was just going out of his mind yelling at me on air uh, about the fact that, you know, why am I spreading this propaganda? Yeah. And, you know, he was saying it's all bullshit. There's wow. no such thing. There's nothing called Lyme disease. I don't know where you're getting your information. I'll never forget that. And that was about, I'm going to say about 18 years ago. All right. And of course, since then, uh, we've all come a long way. And, and yeah. that's what we learned to talk about it today. But, before we get there, I just want to remind folks about the uh, uh, ongoing contest on FishingCanada.com. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to death to tell you that uh, we have uh, over a million ballots in this month's contest. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Oh, man. That's you know, good people. They're voting, you know what? And, and you know what? Like our last winner for the Mercury Motor, he uh, he had over 300 ballots in, right? Yeah. He put a lot of time and effort into it and thinking, I can't win. He said that. I don't, I know I'm not going to win, but I'm going to keep trying. He yeah. won. So yeah. keep it up. Hey, you never know. If you don't play, you don't win for sure. Exactly. It's free of charge. takes a little bit of your time. Uh there's no reason not to enter and, 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 and enter both. Of course, we've got the Mercury motor that we're giving away every month. And then we've got the Mercury motor on the back of a Prince craft boat and a custom trailer. Yeah. Way. So, but they're two separate contests. If you don't enter both, you won't win either. So yeah, well, yeah. you might win one again or one, I suppose, but yeah, enter, maybe, you're there maybe. you know what? It's like, it's like those people that win the lottery. There's people that win a $50 million lottery. I'll never win this, but I'm going to buy a ticket. What the heck, right? What the heck? It may not be a lottery, but it's a Mercury motor or a Prince Crab boat with a Mercury on it. I'll tell you what, a lot of people can use that, including us. I'd like to have that price. I would totally like that price. So, But Angelo won't let me enter. And Angelo won't let me enter, folks. So I won't let you enter. I guess I won't. I'll be armed. won't even let me touch the motors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's all available at fishingcanada.com. It's free of charge. We're having a lot of fun. Folks are having a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of great information, valuable stuff there that that is uh, just waiting for you. Um, all you have to do is go. If you haven't gone already, shame on you. Uh, we'll move on from there. So, yeah. I, as I told you about uh, 20 years ago almost, I started talking about Lyme disease. Uh, I talked about it because I knew somebody who had it. And... Um, Throughout the course of the last two decades, we've gone from zero awareness to, I think now, 
we're all pretty much in tune with it, certainly in this part of the world. Yep. But my concern, and Pete and I talked about this, you know, as we <sighs> take a little breath from this pandemic that we're in, our numbers are great. We're doing really well as a country, doing extremely well as a province. And now we're starting to get a little more at ease with the whole notion. And uh, as we wander outdoors, I thought it would be important, we, we, we discussed this, and we thought it'd be important to just kind of remind all of us that we have another threat out there that uh, we, we can keep in check by getting better educated. And so today we thought we'd bring somebody on. I've had her on the program, on the radio program, thought we'd bring her on uh, here today to uh, share with you some of uh, her, she's a wealth of information on the subject matter, but um, a lot of scientific stuff that will help you as well. Um, and so let's bring her on. Her name is Wendy Adams. She is research grant director and an, on the advisory board for the Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Welcome to the program, Wendy. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Now, everybody, Wendy is from California. She's from Port. Portola? Where is it? Portola Valley? California? Portola Valley, right, which is right by Palo Alto. Okay. So south of San Francisco, about 45 minutes south of San Francisco. You think you're having better weather than Canada right now, than Ontario <laughs> right now? What do you think? I think, I, I think there's a good chance we're having better weather than everybody right now. So <laughs> we are really lucky. It's about 80 degrees and oh, um and no humidity it's just it's a really nice time right now it, that's dream weather we just went through a sorry Ange, we went through a a stint last week where oh. it was a minimum of 90 every day oh. ridiculous mm -hmm. and humid as hell it was horrible like it was really not fun so i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> Thanks. i know I, I i i went to school on the east coast so i i do know i do remember what that humidity is like and yeah. it's not it's not fun yeah it's not good so. so, Wendy, tell folks a little bit about uh, yourself, your background, and, you know, as important, the uh, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Yeah. Um, so, Bay Area Lyme Foundation uh, was founded to make Lyme disease easy to diagnose and simple to cure. And we were founded in, in 2012 by a group of people who had had this similar experience of uh, having been infected with uh, Lyme disease and then having had a long time between infection and diagnosis. Um, and this is a typical problem with people with Lyme disease. Oftentimes they go months and even years without being diagnosed. Uh, and so they decided to band together and start a foundation because they were researching Lyme and why we didn't have good tests and good treatments. Um, and they decided that there was really a, a paucity, a lack of scientific funding available and that we really needed to increase scientific research funding to find better diagnostics and therapeutics. And so I joined um, shortly after it was founded. And my background is actually in the biotech industry. Uh, and so I'd spent my career helping biotech companies with strategy and um, business development, but I had also had Lyme disease and had the similar experience. I don't know exactly when I contracted it, but I do know I went probably four or five years without being diagnosed. Wow. And, uh, and so I was you know, pretty sick and nobody could kind of figure it out. Uh, I was finally diagnosed. And when I was getting better, I started doing research. How did this happen to me? I work in the biomedical industry. I should, you know, I know how to read papers. I know how to talk to doctors. Why, why wasn't I able to get diagnosed? Uh, and so I decided um, shortly after that to join the foundation and to really work on funding research and funding new research, bringing in uh, new scientific ideas to Lyme disease diagnostics and therapeutics. And so that's what we do. We also do a lot of prevention and awareness programs. So we work with um, the naturalist uh, educators who work in the outdoor education programs in schools. And we do uh, presentations for state park rangers and hiking groups and groups like yourselves who are trying to get the word out about how to enjoy the outdoors while still staying safe. So let me just take a minute to, uh, to speak to all the folks who are uh, on with us today. If you know anybody who you know, maybe has it or has had it or is not feeling well, not quite sure what the reason might be, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be a pretty good idea to reach out to them right now and, and have them join us um, on this great opportunity to have uh, Wendy uh, talk to us about this thing. Um, and also, if you have any questions along the way, uh, Mike will, will be 
scouring the, the question section on the site and putting uh, up the ones that are uh, relevant to our discussions. Obviously, we want to talk about Lyme disease. We want to talk about your concerns. If you have concerns about Lyme disease, any questions that you may have in terms of detection, I'm sure Wendy's going to go over a bunch of them here uh, very shortly. Uh, but uh, yeah, ju jump in at any time. And we'll uh, we'll uh, see if we can get you up. Now, you know, you said something that was really interesting, and, and and it made me smile because you said, "How can this happen to me? I'm in the business. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like, how dare those ticks bite me?" Well, mm -hmm. I have a similar story. Um, first, it's like, week, you, it's like you losing a fish hands. How could this happen to me? Well, I can't lose a fish. This is even worse. This is even worse. <laughs> so. So about the first week of May 2019, I had another Lyme expert on the radio program, and he was uh, out of Boston, and we were talking, and, and the reason, that, the relevance there is that it was the start of our fishing season. Everything was starting to open up, so we thought, let's bring another specialist on and talk about, you know, the perils of not preparing yourself for an outing. Anyway, so he was on, great guest, and we, we had a wonderful time. And um, the following week, I went out in the field for a shoot for the Fishing Canada show, and I had my grandson, Nick, with me. And we spent uh, about six days in the wilderness. And halfway through, we both had ticks. Mm. And I, so I know your feeling when you say, how can this happen to me? I talk about it every week. I know all the precautions that you need to take. How can it happen to me? But it does. And in our case, we were covered from head to toe. We had really? three, layers, three layers on. I don't know whether you remember that that week, Pete. We were at, at the Carp Cup. Yeah, we were split up. We were doing a different shoot than you. Half the crew were somewhere else. Right. And um, we had three layers on because it was just awful weather. Cold, windy, and rainy. So we had most of our stuff uh, to cover us from the weather, and they still got So when you're covered from head to toe, that was on the skin after you pulled your three layers off? Yes. Really? Yeah. Wow. So somehow, obviously, because of where we were. Now, we were in a hotbed. We knew going into this area that it was a listed as a hot zone. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we knew. It's not like we didn't know. This was not a... That's the part that just blows my mind, right? And um, anyway, so we both got them. Now, fortunately, we detected them right away that same day, and, and we were able to remove them. And then we immediately went on the 21-day program um, with, with uh, I believe we had three or five pills a day that we had to take. Um, mm -hmm. We went on you it. You were a mess. You were a mess after that. Oh, I was off. We, did, we also had our, our – we went in and got tested – the same time that we started the medication just to be on the safe side. And so we were fine, but I got to tell you what a shock. So I know what you were talking about when you said, why me? How could it happen to me? Yeah. Well, I think you, so you bring up some really good points. So let me just touch on yep. a few of those. Um, the first is that we know that no matter, so there's always a risk of being bitten, despite the fact that we use repellents and we use, um, you know, good sense ticks are really hardy and they often will find a way to bite. So all, despite all of those precautions, you still have to, um, you still have to do things when you get home that can help prevent bites. So let me just go through, run through a few of those because they're really important to, to talk Wait. about. So um, one is the minute you get home is to take off all of your clothes and throw them in the dryer on high heat for 10 minutes wow. because that can desiccate that can it can dry out the ticks if you it's not okay just to throw them in the washer unless you're washing them on hot water because oh. they can survive water so what you want to do is throw it in the dryer for 10 minutes and then throw it in the washer and this is all this is i mean my kids know this they walk in from a hike and they just strip down in the laundry room and throw them in the dryer for 10 minutes and then you want to immediately get into the shower because oftentimes they'll just crawl around for a while and they won't bite you immediately. And so if you get in the shower, you have a better chance of washing them off. And it's also a good chance to check yourself to see if you see any at that time. So, um, so those are a few things you can do. 
um, that are really important to help reduce the risk you'll get bitten. But there's still, again, there still is a chance. Um, and I saw somebody had a really good question about the sprays or repellents. I can't see who that is, but yes. Um, thanks for asking that question, Nathan. That's really um, important. So there are several different things you can do. So there's something called permethrin, and permethrin is, is a, a chemical that's actually derived from the chrysanthemum flower, and you can impregnate your clothes with permethrin. So you can buy sprays at an outdoor store or washes that you can wash your own clothes in it, or you can also, um, there are companies that will do this for you too. You can also buy these clothes already impregnated at outdoor stores. Um, and so those have tick repellents on them. And then there are several different sprays you can use on your body, on your skin. Um, DEET is one of them, but then you want to get a high percentage. There's something called picaridin, which is also very good. Um, and then you By the can way, use... Mm -hmm. If I could just interrupt you there, because I know a lot of folks will jump on this. It's illegal to have that here. We can't use that. Picaridin or DEET? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, picaridin. And, and our DEET is heavily regulated. We're down to 28.9%, mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. you know, it's not that great. So yeah, yeah. So, so you have, a, so that's, so then the, having the clothes that are protected is even more important, right? Um, and then also um, you, there are natural sprays that are, have, are good. They're not as good. They, they tend to be good, but they don't last a long time. And so you have to constantly reapply them. And that's the, that's the issue is that some of the, you know, the, the chemicals that are maybe less great for your skin last longer. And that is uh, where they get some of their efficacy is they just last so long. Um, so those are a few things you can do. Now, the other things you can do are like tuck your pants into your socks um, and wear something, put your hair up and then wear a, a hat to protect you from uh, from ticks. So those are just a few things to to think about, especially for people who are going outside a lot. So Deanna says uh, she's heard about dish soap and a cotton ball to remove the uh, embedded ticks. Any so you, um, you don't want to use a cotton ball. You don't want to use dish soap. You want to use a needle nose um, tweezers and you want to, and, and we have some information on this on our website at bayarealime.org. Uh, you want to put the tip of the tweezers as close to the skin as possible and pull out the tick um, uh, like quickly and in one motion. Um, you don't want to squeeze the body of the tick because then the what's in the tick will get, get injected. All right. Yeah. Got a, uh, we've got a quick little video I'd like to show everybody that happened on that same that same day that we Nick and I got our ticks. This gentleman had tick a tick bite as well. Go ahead and roll that. You gotta check your You don't twist or squeeze it. You both like yeah, look at each other and look at your yeah. like, so yeah. so yeah. 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 life. Yeah. Clean we, anyway. the, um, we compare the area yeah. with uh, rubbing alcohol or soap. For just uh, some oh, yeah. 99%. You know, they had the 70%, but I was like, no. No, no I want the good chill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess I can drink it after if I need to. Maybe I'll take a swig, yeah. But I'd go blind. You're good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I hate the laugh at another man's misery. Yeah, I completely botched this. <laughs> this is how not to lose. It seems like they don't have the uh, the holding power to remove it. Did you get a normal? Let's move on. Yeah. Oh yeah, I only removed the abdomen. There you go. There you go. You got it. You got it. I got it that time. Yep. I don't know if I got its head, but I no longer have a tick. Right at the end of the animal, there is supposed to be like a protrusion coming out, and I can see that it's there. <laughs> Obviously, there was a lot of things he did wrong there. Wendy, talk to us about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think um, the the good news is is he got it eventually, right? But um, 
you know, there are different tools that you can use to remove ticks. Um, some of them are better than others. The one that we like, um, that we've seen is has two ends actually. And what they look like is like a little crowbar, right? So you go in really close and then you kind of, um, you kind of shimmy oh, yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, but, and, and for us, you know, what we do is we have one in every car. So we just keep that. So we don't have to remember to bring it. Yeah. Um, sometimes you'll be somewhere, even in a park. It's not like you're going hiking. It's just that you go to a park and walk your dog. Um, and so we actually have those tools. Now, his the tweezers you saw, they weren't needle nose. So it no. would have been better if they were like the really thin ones at the yeah. end, because yeah. that will help you get underneath. Um, it's important to remember that ticks have, they inject cement. So they do not, you know, they, they're not easy to get out. Um, so just, wow. you know, he had, he had a hard time. It's not because he was uh, not capable. It's because the ticks have figured out a way to, to, um, to stay attached because that's what allows them to feed for the length of time they need to feed for, right? Which in this particular type of tick is, you know, five to four to six, four to seven days, right? They, they stay on a long time and to do that, they need wow. to really adhere themselves so they don't yeah, get yeah. brushed off. So he pretty much squeezed all the bad stuff out of that tick and probably into his body there again because he broke it open like two or three times. It's yeah, yeah. Well, it's the best thing is to get it out as quickly as possible. We know yeah. that you know some some bacteria and pathogens are passed quickly, but most like Lyme disease usually take a little bit more time right. to transmit. So if you can get it out in the first twenty four hours, you have a much smaller chance of getting bitten. But there's really no of getting infected. There's really no safe attachment time for a tick because some we know some of the viruses um are, are passed within you know 15 minutes an hour or right. something like that very short amount of time adrian wants to know does uh tea tree oil work uh to well it doesn't work to get a tick out um it would work you know what the cdc our cdc recommends is using alcohol to clean the bite site but right. if you're infected cleaning the bite site is not going to help it's not going to keep you from getting it. It's infected. just a matter of cleaning the wound. To yeah. clean the wound. I got a question before we go. I got to go back to the DEET. And what was the other one you said? Permethrin or whatever? Uh, per Picaridin. Okay. Both of those. Okay. Obviously, people want to use that to stay, keep the bugs away to begin with. What is the downfall to that? Like 95% DEET. When we used to use that, muscal DEET, it used to melt fishing line instantly. It was mm -hmm. not very pleasurable to think about that going on your skin. So mm -hmm. what, is there problems with that? Like, I mean, what's the dangers to these things that are going on your skin, in your pores, et cetera, et cetera? Well, the, the problem, so they've done study, the studies basically say that there's, you, you don't want to get above a certain amount in your bloodstream, right? And so the higher you go, the easier it is to get that into your bloodstream. And these are chemicals, right? It's not, so that's why there is this, uh, push towards more natural products like lemon eucalyptus oil. Um, and those seem to work pretty well, but only for a couple hours. So it's really right. about keeping, um, you know, keeping things out of your bloodstream. Um, and the higher percentage of D you have on your body, the, the higher percentage is going to, the, the more it's going to get into your bloodstream more quickly. Right. And is there, is there symptoms or something after the aftermath of too much DEET? What would you, what would happen? Uh, that I don't, that's a great question. I, I don't know that, you know, they can't study these things um, in humans. Yeah. They can't tell, you know, they, they're as, I'm not sure if there are case studies about it. There might be, um, but we only have animal studies and animals can't tell us what their symptoms are from a, you know, how they feel. Right. They, we can just know what, right. what's in their blood. So it's hard, it's hard to study these things. So okay. when, is this something, oh, first of all, let's take Tony's question here. Um, if there's a, a tick embedded in your skin and is removed, you should have the tick to be tested, right? As opposed to what our friend did on video there, throwing it away. So I think it's a good idea. I think there are people uh, who might disagree with that, but we tell people to go ahead and get it tested. Um, if you can um, afford it and you find a place uh, that's reasonable and um, that you trust, we have a couple of places that we will refer people to. Um, it, it is good to know because then you have that information uh, when you go to your doctor, if you do right. develop symptoms, right? And I think it's um, one thing is, you know, one problem is that only about a third of people actually who are diagnosed with Lyme disease actually see a tick or know they have a tick bite, right? So it's a very small percentage. And actually in kids, it's less than 20%. 
So, um, so if you do have a tick, you're lucky. And um, if you can't get it tested, then that's more information. Uh, and it can give you some peace of mind. That being said, you know, you should still, if you develop symptoms after a tick bite, there are things that don't show up in a, in a tick that still might happen. One is um, something called tick paralysis. And that is a, a really scary thing that happens when the toxin uh, from the a protein in the tick actually causes um, a neurotransmitter issues. And so that is not something, the toxin is not something you'd find in a tick test, but it, you would start to develop symptoms of feeling bad and feeling like you are sick after a tick bite. So you should still go to your doctor, even if you think um, your tick wasn't infected. Um, there's another interesting uh, condition that's derived from tick bites, and this is uh, from the Lone Star tick. And the Lone Star tick is, is in Canada as well. It's the one with the big dot on the back, right? And that this is called alpha gal syndrome. And it's an allergy to uh, something in the tick that you develop an allergy to the tick, to a particular sugar called alpha gal. But then that sugar is also in mammalian meat. Yeah. And so you can develop an allergy to red meat or pork. Um, it's, you know, gelatin products. You, things are used in pharmaceuticals, um, like saline bags or used in hair care products. Or, or, and that is very, that's life threatening. And that is like a peanut allergy, basically, except it's not to a peanut, but it is an anaphylactic response. So if you start and you won't, you won't necessarily connect it to a tick um, because it, it's not an allergy to the tick bite. It's an allergy to the to meat you eat after you've been bitten wow. by a tick, right? So, so if you live in a tick area, you're an outdoorsman or have had tick bites, and you discover that you start to feel like you are have it's hard to breathe and you have throat swelling, you get to a doctor, you get to the ER immediately, and they'll they'll because that's life threatening. So wow, that's crazy. That's what, ha what happens. Yeah, so 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 it, if you're fortunate enough to find that tick and pull it out, uh, like we did, that's that's fine because you can start the process right away and and uh, hopefully, it, not all ticks. By the way, not all ticks are carrying the disease. So it's not like if you get bit, you're done. No, you still have the chance that the tick was not a carrier. However, my question is this. So what happens, so the tick is on you. Uh, first of all, how long does it need to feed? And then what happens after it's finished feeding, assuming you haven't discovered it yet, although I have no idea how that would happen, but but let's assume that for a moment. What happens to that tick? Yeah, so um, so yes, the question you asked about if, if a tick doesn't even have it, right? What happens? So there are many different types of ticks and each type of tick um, has different pathogens, has different bacteria or viruses or parasites that it can transmit. So, you know, the dominant tick on the East Coast is what's called Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick or the black-legged tick, more appropriately. It doesn't carry certain pathogens, but the lone star tick carries, might carry a certain pathogen. So it, it really um, is, depends on the tick that you've been bitten by, what you can contract. And then it also depends on how long that tick has fed, right? Because some, some pathogens are transmitted much more quickly than um, Lyme disease is. Lyme disease is, is thought to transmit over a longer amount of time. And that is usually the case. Um, but other viruses, you might've heard of uh, bourbon virus or heartland virus, those are transmitted very quickly. And so that's why there's really no safe attachment time for a tick. Um, but again, that all depends on the tick. And then um, what happens when it drops off? So that's a great question. Um, you can, well, the tip, tick will drop off after it's finished feeding. It can only expand so far. And um, certainly with the Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick, that takes, you know, kind of four to six days, days to feed. And then it would drop off. It would drop off because it can't feed anymore. It would explode. Um, and then it lays its eggs, right? It molts. It takes a while to molt. It's not going to molt immediately, but it would molt. And uh, if it's a female, lay eggs or it will change. Um, it will molt to the next stage, right? So if it's a larval tick, it will turn into a nymph. And if it's a nymphal tick, it'll turn into an adult. 
Wow. So yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So um, the other, uh, yeah, I think that's the, those are the important parts, but there's one, so these are hard body ticks that I'm talking about now. There are soft body ticks um, and they are feeding is much different. They tend to live in rodent nests and we, we see that in California, it's a problem. We, and, and on the East coast, and I'm sure you all have it too. Um, they live in rodent nests, oftentimes in like old cabins, right? That have wooden walls and there, there are rodents that, ha- that get into the cabin walls. These soft body ticks feed differently. They only feed for 15 minutes. They come out at night, they will bite you and feed for 15 minutes and then disappear. But they feed more, more often, right? They don't just feed once per life stage. Um, and, and this is a huge problem because you then you never see a tick and they pass different pathogens. They pass a related pathogen to the Lyme bacteria, um, but it has it looks different clinically. And this is a problem for doctors because actually um, uh, the New York Times did a, an article on, um, they always have this diagnosis column that's written by a doctor that show, shows the different um different symptoms that go into to a hard diagnosis. And the one one from just a few days ago was actually one of these relapsing fever spirochetes. So um, that actually is passed by by the deer tick. So there are different pathogens and it depends on where you are and what you've been bitten by. Wow. Calvin uh, wanted to know, can you get Lyme disease any other way other than ticks? So that's a great question. And not that we know of, although there have been there has been Lyme disease in studies found in mosquitoes. And, and this is not um, surprising yeah. because they're feeding on the same animals, right? They're feeding right. on, now it has no, what has not been proven is that mosquitoes can pass Lyme disease. Okay. So that has not been proven, but the right. only, the other way that you can, you can get it um, is from, if you're a mom, you can pass it to your child. And oh. so if you're, if you're pregnant, it's really important. You get a tick bite it's really important that you go to your doctor immediately and get treated immediately. Um, and there are safe antibiotics to take during pregnancy. That is not the issue. You just need to get treated absolutely immediately. Um, even if you don't think it's been on for long enough, or you don't think, you know, you don't think it wasn't that big when you took it off, doesn't matter because it can infect the fetus and it can have, um, it can cause, uh, miscarriage or birth defects, and that's been proven. So, um, and this is not, that's not strange because um, if you look at, you know, the Lyme spirochete, which is the bacteria type it is, um, is closely related to the syphilis spirochete and syphilis definitely is transmissible as well. So those are, um, that's a really important um, fact. And then the other on the blood um, blood supply, people ask about the blood supply a lot. Um, the Borrelia can survive blood, uh, banking. It's never been shown to be, have been transmitted. However, lots of other tick-borne diseases have been shown to be transmitted through the blood supply, um, including, um, Babesia, which is a parasite and anaplasma and Ehrlichia. So these are also, um, tick-borne diseases that, um, have been transmitted through the blood supply with associated deaths. I mean, when you are oftentimes when you're giving blood to somebody, they're either blood supply or, or organ transplant, I should say, um, you, those, and especially in organ transplantation, those, um, people are immunosuppressed, right? So they are getting a new pathogen plus their, their immuno, their immune system has been, um, shut off because they've gotten an organ transplant. Right. So there are cases of this is known are cases. Wow. Um, and so this is something this is why, um, you know, you have to be careful. I want to step back and answer uh, before you go to the, the other question that came up there. When you talked about the first t- type of tick, I can't remember if you said soft or hard, whatever ones, but the one that clings on for an amount of days, fills up and falls off. So yeah. a person hasn't detected that tick. They are at home right now. That tick falls off and so now it lays its eggs. So can it do that in your couch, in your house, in, indoors? Can it do it in your carpet? And can you have a, a bunch of baby ticks running around your house after that? Is that possible? Um, well, I, you know, in theory, yes, depending on how long the tick is there. But I'm not, I ha- would have to go back and review the, uh, the how long it takes. It, right. it probably takes much longer. So the chances that that, happen, that that happens, and it's only for an adult tick. 
right? right. The other, the other um, stage, the earlier stages aren't right. laying eggs, right? right? It's just the adult female tick that would right. do that. So um, it's probably, it probably takes much longer than that. So um, I'd have to go back and review the exact timing, but it probably takes much longer okay. than that. Uh, okay. Deanna had an interesting question to do with, I mean, you were talking about transmitting it through blood. Uh, she wants to know, can you acquire it from eating an infected animal? Um, so not that we know of, it's never been shown to be transmitted through that. Um, so I can't, I can't say there's any data either way. Um, but that's a good question with, um, certainly with deer, right? Yeah. People eat venison. Yes, yes. And I think the key there is, is, um, cooking it to a high enough temperature. By the Borrelia way, does, Borrelia does not like, um, it doesn't really like heat. So, um, you know, if you cook it, chances are it's, it's, uh, you're you're fine. Uh, Tim Sturgeon is asking uh, if you wear DEET from the knees down, will that keep you safe? I just want to add before you answer that. Let me let me add this. Not only did we have three layers, and the outer layer being a totally weatherproof, waterproof garment, but not only did we have that with elastic cuffs on the garments, but we sprayed ourselves with DEET. And still got ticks. Two, yeah. of us, two of us out of the five got ticks. These are these are very hardy creatures. Um, the answer is no. It's not protective because you know when you're walking with in grass, grass can be higher, and the ticks will you know they can um, you know if you're walking through grass that's higher, they can attach to something that's not that doesn't have deep. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen, so it's said that they can't fall from trees or I, I, I wouldn't put it past them. So I think that's why I, I wouldn't do the kind of selective, oh, I'm only going to do this. I'm only going to do this, do as much protection as you can. And then when you get home, still do the shower and the throwing of the, um, clothes into the dryer for 10 minutes on high, like you got to just do it all. I've talked to enough experts on this, uh, Wendy, to, to say to folks, there is no one simple way to protect yourself. You need yeah. to do everything imaginable. Uh, and probably the most important thing, you, you need to be an adult. Okay, You need to know, if I walk into that area, there's a very good chance that I'm going to make contact with a tick. So knowing that, as an adult, I'm going to take every precaution possible to prevent it from happening to me, my kids, my dog, pets mm -hmm. are another big problem, aren't mm -hmm. they? Yeah. That's probably the most difficult um, ones to protect. Yep. Protect. yep. So and I see some good questions. Um, so Deanna asked again, can animals become infected? And the answer is absolutely yes, because animals are, are the reservoir for the bacteria in nature. So uh, for example, white-footed mice, are the main reservoir kind of where you are, I, th I think, yeah. and certainly on the East Coast of the US. On the West Coast, so BC, you know, British Columbia on down, um, it can be much more varied. In California, any small mammal can be a reservoir. Um, as a result, we have a lot more strains of the Lyme disease pathogen because, you know, it, it can be in voles, it can be in moles, it can be in mice, it can be in rats, it can be in squirrels is a major reservoir here, right? And so that means wow. that the bacteria is changing in each one of those mammals. And so ticks are picking up different versions of that. Um, so that so that's really important. And deer, can, deer can be infected, but it's not thought, thought that deer are a reservoir. But what deer help do is support large numbers of ticks because they're so big that a lot of ticks can feed on them. So if you have a lot of deer, a lot more ticks can survive because they have more uh, more animal to feed on, if you will, right? A bigger animal as opposed to a little, um, you know, a little mouse. A deer can support a lot of ticks. How about a cure? How about a vaccine? Mm. How about like, give us something to, to, uh, to, to, to sort of feel good about. Yeah, um, so I think the good news on the, so I'll talk about diagnostics and then therapeutics. So the good news on, on the diagnostic side is that there are new technologies that are, are looking to be better at diagnosing Lyme. The current test we have is based on an, an antibody response. 
And th so this is how it, this is testing whether or not your immune system has seen the Lyme and it has created an immune response to the bacteria. So the problem with that is that it's not reliable in the first month of infection. It's not reliable depending on what stage you're at. It, it can, you know, can get more reliable, but early on in the first month, it's only about 30% sensitive, meaning it's only going to pick up 30% of the cases that are actually there because the immune response hasn't developed yet. Yeah. And so this is a huge problem because acute, you want to treat Lyme in the first month so that that's when you have the best chance of getting completely better. Right. And so what we're trying to do is find a, a test for the early disease. And that is, those are looking really exciting because of all these new technologies that you might've heard about because of COVID actually. So the CRISPR technology and the next generation sequencing. So these are all technologies that people are studying in Lyme disease to see if we can detect the pathogen early on, as opposed to the immune response, which is what we want. Um, on the therapeutic side, uh, we are looking for different drugs that treat, especially late stage Lyme, right? Lyme that hasn't been diagnosed for a while because the tests are bad and, um, and or people who have been treated and are still symptomatic um, because that's a large problem as well. And so uh, the things that Bay Area Lyme has been working on are working with scientists who are screening currently um, already FDA approved drugs, so already drugs that are on the market to see if they have activity against the, the bacteria in a test tube. Um, and we have found some interesting ones that are be, that are helping in clinical studies um, of Lyme patients, and, but they've already been approved. We don't have to go through the FDA approval process uh, totally. And then we're also supporting a lot of scientists who are doing new drug development. So using, for example, monoclonal antibodies, which again is something you hear about in COVID, um, which would help the immune system fight the bacteria. Um, and so we're, we fund a lot of therapeutic studies for um, treatments for late stage Lyme because, you know, right now it's hard to get treated. It's hard to get better if you've had the disease for a long time, uh, oftentimes, or if you've been treated and are still symptomatic. Is On the vaccine, can I just talk about the vaccine? Um, yeah. So it's a great, it's a great point because we all want a vaccine. Um, we haven't figured out yet. There was a vaccine on the market. It was taken off for a, couple, for a reason I won't go into, but there are people working on vaccines. Um, the interesting thing is, so how do you, you know, you could make a vaccine for Lyme disease, which is important. However, there are all these other tick-borne diseases, right? And so just being protected against Lyme may not be enough. And right. so what people are working on now is to create a vaccine against the tick saliva. So that ticks couldn't feed long enough to transmit most, most pathogens. Oh, and so, cool. right. Which, which cool. is an anti tick vaccine as opposed to just an anti uh, Lyme disease vaccine. Um, so there are, those aren't in, um, those aren't being tested yet. Those are in early stages. There are some Lyme, there is a Lyme disease vaccine against only Lyme that's in like late stage clinical studies. And then there are some ones that are, kind of in earlier stage clinical studies that protect against more kinds of, more strains of the bacteria. So earlier on, Anz was saying that he had, when he started this on the radio show 20 years ago, medical experts were saying to him, why are you even talking about this in your radio show? This, this doesn't exist in now. Now we're fast forwarding 20 years now. Is it more accepted worldwide or US or, or, or whatever? Is it more accepted? And then uh, is it a reality to all doctors, let's say? And then is, is it difficult for you to guys, you for you to still get funding, at, uh, you know, for Lyme disease because you're into that. Uh, yeah. So on the doctor side, I think um, I think there is more acceptance. However, it's still misdiagnosed all the time. I can't right. even tell you. We hear this every week, right? And and so the CDC, um, you know, you before it was people heard a thirty thousand disease number in the states, right? Oh, there are only thirty thousand cases. But those weren't the actual cases. Those were just the cases that were reported to CDC, right? right? And the CDC had always said, listen, it's really 10 times that number, but nobody really read the footnote. And so now they put out a paper, you know, several years ago that said, no, 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 it's, it's, it is at least, it's really probably more like 350 or 400 now because the cases since that study was done in like 20, 2014 based on cases in 2010, um, it, it's, 
increased even more. So it's probably in this in the states about four hundred thousand. We know in Europe that the um, the you know the tick that that causes this in Europe is throughout all of Europe. So Europe is thought to be eighty thousand cases, but that's again that's a that's a gross understatement. Um, and I know that the numbers in Canada have been rising as well. Um, I think um, we're getting more case studies and. and and I talked to you about him before, but there's a doctor at um, Queens University who's a cardiologist, and he's done the best um, case studies and case series of patients who have come into the ER who have Lyme carditis. And this is something I want to talk about because it's really important. Um, Lyme can, Borrelia, when you get a, an infection by a tick, can quickly um, go to the heart. It actually likes the heart because it likes collagen and the heart is full of collagen. So it goes to the heart uh, on sometimes about, you know, we think like 10% of cases and the inflammatory response. So the immune system rushing into the heart to fight the bacteria causes electrical disturbances. So the rhythm of your heart gets thrown off by the inflammation. It's literally interrupting the signals to your heart. So this is life threatening. And if you start to feel faint or nauseous, or you feel like your heart's racing or that your heart's not beating enough, you have to get to an ER immediately and tell them you suspect that you've been bitten by a tick or that you've been in the outdoors because they will, um, the treatment is much different. The treatment um, for, it's called AV block. Um, if you have Lyme disease, then you treat AV block with antibiotics. But if you don't have Lyme disease, then you treat AV blocks sometimes with getting a pacemaker put in, which is something you have to have for the rest of your life. Um, and so Dr. Um, uh, Adrian Barra, um, Baranchuk, uh, he did this case series because he noticed all these young, it's, it's three to one males, and oftentimes in younger males, were ending up to get a pacemaker put in. And he started looking at these going, this is weird, why is this happening? And realized that they all had, most of them had a history of a tick bite, or they had a history of a, of a erythema migraine's rash. They had a rash and, and the ER had not diagnosed them as Lyme disease when they should have, you know, these were just missed in the ER. And he's, so he's published several case series of these. Um, there was actually just a Canadian who died of misdiagnosed Lyme carditis. Uh, that was just recently published in the last couple of months. Um, and he's now published a suspicion score so that if somebody coming into the, the ER um, cause again, it's early, oftentimes you won't have a positive antibody response. And it's also thought that in, um, Lyme carditis, for some reason, uh, it looks like there's a, there are fewer rashes and this might be because it's early. They might've not developed a rash or, you know, some people never get the rash. So this is, this is a, a case where it's really, really important to know your body. And if you know that you've been outside or could have been, uh, could have had a tick bite, could have been around ticks, then you get yourself to the ER and you tell them that so that um, they can be, they, they, they can factor that in. And, and you're not even supposed to be tested. If a doctor suspects you of Lyme carditis, you immediately start treatment. You don't wait until the next day to see an infectious disease doc. You don't wait to the next day to fill your prescription. They put you, they should put you on it in the ER immediately because it can devolve very quickly. And the problem, the problem with that as you know, Wendy, is that mainstream uh, practitioners, it's out of mind. Not mm -hmm. the, see, today, 20 years ago, they just didn't accept that. It, it, it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Today, there's far more information out there, so the acceptance level is up. But the problem is it's out of mind. You go to ER with heart problems, and I'll guarantee you that every single one of those specialists in that ER, ER room there's no way in hell they're going to think about Lyme disease unless you point it out to them. And the reason yeah. I make the point is I think that's important. We need to be a little more proactive. Now that we've armed ourselves with all this great information, when we're in the outdoors, if something happens, and it could be a tick bite, we need to be more proactive. We need to go to the medical community. And I'll give you a good example. I did that when I when when Nick and I got bit. I went to my practitioner and told him what had happened, and he started giving me this long about story. I said, "No, no. What I want you to do is give me a script for this, 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 and this, and I want to start it immediately. 
then book me in to have a test. And so he did. But had I not been proactive, I'd have gone through months and months of testing and, 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 and you know, mm -hmm. test by golly. And that's the problem right now with the medical community. They've accepted it. It's real, but it's not top of mind. Yeah. So, and, you know, and there's a, there, the problem, there are a couple of problems that you bring up there that are really important. One is that, um, you know, they, if they don't see the bullseye version of the rash, right. they don't believe it's a Lyme disease rash. And exactly. the, bull, the bullseye rash is an atypical rash. So only okay. one in six Lyme patients will show up with a bullseye rash. More often, this is, um, it's a homogenous rash. It's just a plain red circular or oval rash, or it can look blue. And actually, um, Dr. Baroncheck published a case about this particular thing that happened in his ER, despite the fact that he's doing Lyme disease research. Somebody misdiagnosed the rash as cellulitis, which is another infection, um, as opposed to an erythema migrans, which is the Lyme disease rash. So that's a huge problem. Um, and, and this happens all the time. They've done studies. Doctors don't know. Um, it's in public, it's in, uh, na national institutes of health in the U S documents incorrectly. It's in textbooks incorrectly. People wow. call it the bullseye rash and that is not correct. A bullseye, the bullseye version of it is just a subset of what that rash can look like. So, wow. um, so I think that's really important. Uh, another thing you mentioned that was also important, and this is definitely um, not well understood or um, not known, and that is once you take antibiotics for Lyme disease, your rash will not turn, your, sorry, your test will not turn positive. No. And, but that's not because you don't have it. That's because the antibiotics um, tamp down the immune response. So this is a this is something that's been published, but most doctors don't understand the subtlety of this, which is once you've given somebody doxycycline for we don't know how long, you know, maybe a week or two, they their antibody response doesn't develop because it doesn't need to. It's, right. You have antibiotics that have helped out. So you won't test positive. So after you've taken antibiotics, you, you shouldn't bother to take the test because it's not it's not um, going to help you make a that's, decision. So that's, very yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. 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 And so like that, you can't use it to determine when you're better, right. right? A negative test after you've taken antibiotics doesn't mean that you are not infected. Um, so, so it's, it's, this is the problem with having an immune response uh, test, right? And why we want to instead test for the pathogen itself. This is a crazy disease. This is, this disease reminds me of a combination of a ghost and a zombie. Okay. You can't see it. You don't know where the hell it is. And then all of a sudden you can't kill it. Like what the hell is going on? This is, yeah. this is yeah. It's frustrating. It's frustrating for doctors too. Um, and I think, you know, there's a much bigger, we call, you know, we've been talking about Lyme disease, but you know, the really, the much bigger issue is tick borne, tick borne infections, right? Because it's not just Lyme and some people get more than one. They might get bitten by a second tick that's infected with something different, or they might get, you know, one tick can have several different infections. Oh my God. And so that, that can confound um, diagnosis and it also can hurt treatment, right? Because then you have to take multiple different drugs to get better. So it's important for, um, for you and to make sure your doctor um, tests you for more than just Lyme disease if you've been bitten. Right. And because one is a parasite and then there are other bacteria that won't test positive on a Lyme disease test. Are we getting any better at um, at the testing level? Because and I'll tell you why I say this. When I did have my problem, um, I was told by somebody in a lab that they would have to take three tests and two out of th two out of the three would have to come back positive in order for them to feel that they have got a chance wow. at being positive. The problem with that thinking though, uh, Wendy, when I, when I was first told about it, because I know what that time frame is, you know, the first 24 hours, 36, uh, et cetera, their testing process would, would leave you vulnerable without knowing, without starting your cure for, for a period of 30 days. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is to me, it's like it's that's insane. Yeah. That's why that's why I said no. We're going on it right now. I really don't care about the testing. Mm -hmm. I want to 
activity on the uh, antibiotics now for that simple reason that if, if you go along with their thinking that it could take three tests, then 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 it's all over. If it's positive, it's 32 days after the fact, you're done. <laughs> things are well, I, <laughs> yeah, it's it's um this is confusing, right? Um yeah. is the two tier so first of all, at least in the United States, I'm I'm guessing it's clear in Canada, it's also this case in Canada, is that um the two tier test is not um you don't need a two tier positive test to be diagnosed with Lyme. Ah. It's only the two tier test is for a surveillance case definition, which means a case that's reportable to the CDC. You do not need a positive test. For example, if you have a rash and erythema migraines, that is indicative of an infection and you shouldn't test in that case. It's a waste of a test because the taste, the test can be negative despite the fact that you have a rash. Um, so, so it is a clinical diagnosis and is supposed to be a clinical diagnosis. Laboratory testing can be helpful, um, but it should not be required for a diagnosis because otherwise you you wouldn't be able to diagnose anybody in the first month when because the antibody response hasn't developed yet. And so this is one of the, the huge issues in testing and in diagnosis is that doctors misuse the test. They don't know how to use it, when it should be believed when it should be used at all, um, and when it when it shouldn't. So the the two tier tests that you're talking about, the first is a screening test. It's called the um, ELISA, and the problem with that test, usually if you have a two tier screening uh, algorithm, the first one, the first test should be 100% sensitive, right? You should want to rule everybody in, so that um, you make sure that the second test, which is more um, would give you more specificity, would be able to take out the people who um, tested positive who weren't really positive on the first test. But the problem is the first test is only, you know, 45% accurate. So there are people who test negative because they don't test first tier positive. And so therefore the second tier isn't even done. Oh. So this is, this is again, the problem. And this is a, this is a test that's used for, should be used for surveillance. Um, to make sure that, um, you know, the cases that are counted are really true cases, um, but it's not a great diagnostic test for clinical care. The other thing is that in the U.S., and I think it's probably the same in Canada, but I'm not sure, is that depending on which state you live in, there are different criteria for a surveillance case. Of course. So in the U.S., in, the US, in California or on the West Coast, not only do you have to have a bullseye rash, you also have to have a two tier positive test to be counted as a surveillance case. Wow. Well, if you have a bullseye rash and get tested, you're no matter what in that first 30, 30 days, right? And so you can't be if you get a negative test, despite the fact that you have a bullseye, you won't get counted, right? So it's it's horribly restrictive. On the East Coast, it's a little different because the infection rate is higher and they're in considered endemic states. So on the East Coast and in the Midwest, if you're in one of 14 or 15 states that are endemic, you just have to have an erythema migraines uh, a rash or you have to have a positive test. But you don't have to have both to be considered a case. I'm going to uh, show the people, Wendy, you brought up a great point before we started that image now, all of you people have ever eaten a poppy seed muffin. You know what it looks like, okay? <laughs> Look at this right here. Explain that to us, Wendy. Yeah, so these are um, nymphal ticks. And you can see on the left-hand side, as you zoom out a little, um, that they all look like poppy seeds. They're all about the same size. And if you look on the right, you see, you know, there's kind of a smattering or four or five of them. You can see their legs, right? This is how small they are. And it's really hard to see them. They can look like a freckle, which is why, um, which is why you know, so many people get bitten and have no idea they've been bitten um, until they until they've started to feed. Now, nymphal ticks, uh, those ticks, even when they have fed, they're very hard to see. Um, so, so the adult ticks are are easier to see, but those nymphal ticks, which are the, really the ones that pass the most 
uh, tick-borne infections are very, very difficult to see. So one thing I can tell folks, uh, before we get to Adrian's, sorry, Adrian, we'll, we'll actually deal with Adrian's question now, and then I'll get over to uh, to uh, the other one I want to talk about. Okay, so um, so the the anaphylactic, the allergic response I was talking to is not Lyme disease. That is an allergy to something called um, alpha-gal, alpha-galactase. Um, so that in, once you're diagnosed with that, my guess is, yes, you do carry, you do carry an EpiPen, but Lyme for Lyme disease, um, there's not an allergic reaction in Lyme disease. What I was talking about is Lyme carditis, which is not an allergy. It's an infection of the heart that needs to be treated in the ER. Um, and you have to, um, oftentimes get a temporary pacemaker inserted, um, to get your electrical rhythm, um, corrected in your heart. So two That's different, right. two different things. So, what? Yeah, it's scary. It, 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 it's getting scarier by the moment. Okay. Hey, what's that? It's getting scarier by the moment. Yeah. Right. So, what I wanted to say to people listening to this and watching this right now, who are outdoors people, you know, and and saying to yourself, like, what am I going to do? Yeah. I can't go outside anymore, right? No. But one thing you do have to do is you have to. Um, you have to strip yourself of embarrassment. And I'll tell you why. There was a great question earlier on, Mike. I don't know whether you can find it. Um, somebody wanted to know what happens if you're in the woods for a week and you got no showers and you and you you got, you know, no dryer and, 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 and all this stuff. Ah, like, what are you going to do? You have to rely on your buddy, okay, because you can't be embarrassed for somebody to be checked. There's parts of your body that you can't see. You can't possibly check. And if you're in the woods for a week without shower, without a dryer, without this and without that, and you think that you might have been exposed, or even if you don't think you might have been exposed, if you're in a hot zone, you need a buddy check, which is a little difficult for most of us to the do. Word, the words you don't want to hear are, Angelo, you're going to die. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think and the important thing there too is that ticks like places that are hard to see right. because they like moist, wet places. So they like the groin, they like the belly button, they like um, armpits, and they like the backs of knees, right? So um, these are places that you should check um, and make sure you check like every day. Um, my yeah. nephew had one embedded in, behind his ear oh. um, that his... Uh, he didn't see um, until it was uh, engorged. And actually another friend, her daughter was playing with my daughter um, in a, in a park like setting and got one on her eyelid and it was right in the crease of the eyelid. And it wasn't until, um, you know, she, she sent a picture to her sister who's a nurse uh, and she, their sister said, did you enlarge the picture? And she said, no. And so when she enlarged it, she could see little legs. Right. But it just looked like a freckle to her, but it was bigger. She just didn't know that it was a tick. So, um, yeah, you just kind of have to be vigilant, especially during, you know, the high tick season, which uh, for you all is is kind of May to November. Um, and hunters really are at great risk, right? Because they're sitting in the blinds and and yeah. um, there's yeah. an actual there's an actual um, increase in cases in kind of hunting season. I was going to I was going to say, because I uh, how is it that I've hunted and fished? for 50 plus years and I've been in the bush and so many times and I would never, I have no idea if I had one or not. I've never seen a symptom or whatever. Maybe I never did get bit. Maybe I did get bit. I don't know. Yet somebody can go in the bush for one week and be annihilated by these. How, how I mean, it's, it's almost a, is it a luck of the draw for me or, or are there certain people that maybe don't get infected? Is there something like that happening out there? Well, so what, here's what we know is that people, um, especially in highly endemic areas, there are people who, who test positive on the test despite never having been diagnosed with Lyme. So some wow. people are getting bitten and then not getting sick or their immune system is handling it just fine or they've taken yeah. antibiotics for something else and it's cured the Lyme. We don't, we don't know. Um, okay. What we do know, we did um, fund some work that showed that the people who didn't get better, and these are people infected early, diagnosed early, for sure had Lyme, took three weeks of antibiotics. The people who were still symptomatic had a less uh, robust immune response early on 
right? That you could really see an immune response difference in the people who did get better and the people who didn't. And the people who didn't get better, they didn't have their immune response fully develop. And the, the antibodies that did develop had mutations. They weren't binding well. And so, um, so that might be part of it too. That might be just kind of an inherent difference in the, there is an inherent difference in people's immune systems, right? Um, and it could be that some immune systems are less able to fight it. Um, those are fun. Those are studies we're funding, but um, it's again, it's really, these are really hard studies to do because um, people get Lyme disease in different places and some of them test positive, some of them don't, but um, there is a, a demonstrably different response in people who do get better, at least in this small study. Wendy, in, in all the time I've spent with this terrible disease, I don't recall ever hearing about a child with Lyme disease. Am I wrong? You're absolutely uh, wrong, actually. Um, <laughs> sorry, but there are two, um, it's, it's bimodal, right? The, um, you know, especially around 10, but children up to 18 um, are 25% of the cases. Wow. And wow. then um, the other uptick is uh, adults between 50 and 70. And it's because they're spending more time outside. They might be gardening. They might, be, you know, they might retire. So um, that those are really the the place, the age groups where there are the most um, cases. And especially in children, um, in children, it can look very different um, from a symptom perspective. So a lot of kids aren't diagnosed until um, they are diagnosed with learning disabilities or behavioral problems. It can often cause psychiatric or psychological issues um, yeah. in children. And we don't know why. Um, we just know that, you know, Lyme, the Borrelia does infect the brain. It's a, it, it's, um, you can be infected in your brain. And so um, for whatever reason, kids aren't diagnosed until they have, um, you know, they, they're having problems in school or they're having behavioral issues. Um, kids are also, oftentimes they'll get facial palsy so one side of their face will start to droop um, and that's an infection of their nerve. Um, and that can happen in adults too, but it, it certainly seems to, to be a, a cause in children. So that's something to watch out for. You, you remember me, Pete, with my palsy years ago? Yes. Yeah. I believe to this day that I had Lyme. Mm. I, yeah. I, uh, it was diagnosed as, well, it wasn't totally diagnosed, but there was reference to it being Bell's palsy which which uh, I think was the left side or the right, I can't remember now, but one of, one of uh, you, you lose control of your mm -hmm. uh, facial mus muscles. I uh, developed a limp. I felt terrible. Every bone in my body ached for a year. Mm -hmm. I had probably every single test done to me known to man, except obviously Lyme. Mm -hmm. and I had nothing. I had nothing when it was all done, but I spent a year suffering. So if, okay, there's a great question then. If, Indeed, Angelo did have Lyme back then, if he did, more than a 50 50 chance he did or didn't. Could he still have that in him to this day, or does his body say, That's it, it's over, see you later, bye bye? So, we don't, we don't know. We don't know if people are still infected because we don't have the right test, right? And so, it could be that Lyme, it, that the Borrelia pathogen is, is, becomes part of your microbiome, right? And your immune system can control it like it controls all the other things that are you're infected with that are latent. Um, but it also, so it could be that it's eradicated. So it's important to remember that there are, you know, two things to getting better. One is um, an antibiotic, but the other is a competent immune system, right? Because antibiotics don't cure infections in and of themselves. Right. They, they help the immune system catch up. So the immune system can do its job eradicating the pathogen, but but the antibiotic kind of keeps it under control um, and until the immune system can catch up. Right. So um, some people, you know, who might have uh, problems with their immune system might not be able to clear it, right? Because the antibiotic is helping, but it's not helping enough for the immune system to um, yeah. to solve to fully th solve the problem. So these are all things that we want to study, and and it's very hard to study. Um, you know, if you look in the animal research, um, and this has been shown in mice and in rats and in dogs and in um, non-human primates, is that, you know, you do treat an animal um, and some animals are still infected even after, you know, a month of doxycycline or a month of ceftriaxone, which is, which is um, 
uh, an IV drug. What we don't know um, is, you know, what what is that spirochete doing? What's the bacteria doing? Is it causing the problem or is it the, the inflammatory response, the immune system that's kind of um, causing the problem because it's it's fighting too much or it's not fighting enough or, you know, what that um, homeostasis is, how, how is that balance working? But we do know that there's no, there's no doubt that in animals and there are human studies showing too, that the bacteria can persist after a month or even more of antibiotics. We're just trying to find out, okay, then what, what helps us get rid of that? Um, blood type plays a role in this or not? Um, so, I think there might be like one study out there, but it's not thought to play any difference or to make any difference. But, you know, you bring up a really good point. And that is that, you know, there, there are two things here. There's, there's the human that gets bitten, but there's also the, the bacteria that's, that gets infect that infects. Right. And there are different versions of the, of the bacteria that can be, um, that can be injected into you. Right. There are different strains and they're also different species. And so that's one thing we're also trying to understand because there are kind of two different systems here you have to understand to know what's causing which symptoms. So, cause it's, it's thought that like, for example, some people get a worse type of inflammatory uh, arthritis as their symptom. We know that the European strains, um, which are called Afzelii and Garinii, uh, one of them causes uh, neurological disease a lot more often. The ba that bacteria really likes the brain, and the other causes dermatological disease. But in in uh, Europe, you don't get as much arthritic disease as you do um, in this on this continent. So um, that's also really interesting. One very quick question. I know you got to go very soon. I get that. If a person has got inflammatory problems due to Lyme disease and they are misdiagnosed as uh, uh, some type of a psoriatic arthritis, mm -hmm. and they're on Humira, would mm -hmm. Humira mask the Lyme disease inflammation? Or would you would it say, nah, that's not gonna work on me? I'm asking that because of my wife. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's a good, um, my husband's on Humira as well, so it's something I think about. Um, yeah. So, we know, so in a certain type of Lyme disease, and that is called Lyme arthritis, um, it seems, seems to be just um, mostly in the knee or in the joints. Um, in those patients, and that's a very um, defined subset, you people do get um, a disease modifying agent, right? Which is more like a steroid, right? And, right? and after they've tried, but even then they try one month of antibiotics, and then they can try, doctors will try a second month of antibiotics. And some of those patients who didn't get better in one month of antibiotics do get better in two months of antibiotics. But after two months, uh, rheumatologists will usually treat them with like methotrexate or something right. kind of disease, you know, some something to tamp down the inflammation. Right. And in those particular patients, that seems to work. Um, but in a general population where you might have neuro neurological symptoms, you might have um, uh, cardiac symptoms, you might have, you know, uh, um, nervous system, peripheral nervous system problems, uh, giving in an anti inflammatory is probably not a good idea, right? You, but we don't really, the problem is we don't really know. We do know that people, um, what is a hot puts people at higher risk for getting long-term symptoms is when you treat them initially, you give them an immunosuppressive, right? If you give somebody because you misdiagnose them, they're misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis or some kind of other autoimmune disease, and you give them prednisone or something like that, they are more likely to go on to develop um, post-treatment Lyme symptoms, right? Persistent Lyme disease. Okay. So that's that you really don't want to do that. Yeah, um, and, that's, and, and the same thing happens if you treat them with the wrong antibiotics, right? The antibiotics that don't fight that particular bacteria, because, you know, there are many different antibiotics, they, they go against different types of bacteria. So if you treat somebody who has Lyme disease with the wrong, the wrong antibiotic, that also puts them at much higher risk of being diagnosed with persistent symptoms. So we know those two things are really um, bad to do up front, which is why the, the diagnosis early on is so crucial. Okay. Um, wow. What can I say? I know. 
you uh, crazy. You open our minds, I'm sure. Uh, I know um, we've got ruined my weekend. I was going to go on the bush. Now I'm not going anywhere. We so. want you to have fun. We are all outdoors people. We want you to have fun, but we just, know. Uh, you know, we want people to understand the risk and use preventative measures, and then go into their doctor with uh, armed with knowledge. Yeah, Wendy. One of the things that it's been my pet peeve for some time following this this subject. Um, it's so fragmented. The information is here, there, scattered all over the place. You can, if you want to, you know, commit the time to, to searching, you can find it. But there doesn't seem to be a, a base, a Lyme disease, I don't know, center that, that we can all sort of plug into and stay on top of. And, and I wish that would happen. I wish somebody, a, a government, a country, I don't even know who, but I wish somebody would just sort of grab it and say, okay, Let's let's create this this hub where people can go. I'm sure there's a lot of people right now that are watching this saying, okay, great. As soon as I get off this, as soon as they're done, I, I got to go check some stuff. But where do they go? Where would you send somebody right now? Please well, I'd send somebody to our website because we have a lot of information on the signs and the symptoms and how to prevent it and research. Um, and that is uh, bayarealime.org. And Lyme is spelled L-Y-M-E. Uh, because we we try and have a, a well curated site that has up to date information, but is still um, but is very reasonable and responsible and and is um, you know lays out the issues. Um, there are a lot of issues, and and you can see different websites have different ways of going about it. Right, um, some are very conservative, um, and the other thing is this is changing. The research is changing all the time. Um, a lot of people are doing research on this. And so, um, you know, papers are coming out uh, all the time about new um, new avenues to diagnose, new potential treatments, and actually then learning more about the pathogen itself, whether it's at the tick or how it transmits to humans. And then a lot of, there's a lot of studies about uh, the ticks themselves. Um, so I know that Canadian Health does have a website. There's an organization called um, uh, Can Hope which is a, a Canadian organization. Um, and then our website is a really good source of information. Um, so would highly recommend people going there and um, you can get in touch with, with us through that website as well. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, Wendy, uh, can't thank you enough for taking the time today. I know, uh, I know you've got some other things on your schedule, but uh, we really appreciate this. And all I can say is uh, keep up, keep up the fight. And uh, keep up the great work. Please. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to talk to you guys, and um, I hope your viewers can have enjoy the outdoors. Just realize, um, you know, what they need to do to keep their family safe and advocate for themselves in case they do feel sick after. Being I outdoors. believe our, our viewers really enjoyed this. I can see from the comments. They trust me. They'll love love this one. So for sure. Well, thanks so much. It's good to talk to you guys again. Thank All you. Right. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Wow. Good well. Time. That's uh, you know, <laughs> that's almost intense, isn't it? Like, it's like and, and, and I've been living with this for two decades because you know I'm I'm a, I've been on this right from day one. Yeah. I, I know I knew it was there. I know it's there, and uh, and so yeah. And, but 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 just having spent an hour with Wendy there, even now I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm saying, yeah. so how yeah. do we how do we deal with this thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Well, it was, uh, it, Angie's been talking about this forever. And when I brought that thing up about my wife, I, we were all talking about every doctor in the world that she's seen talked about rheumatoid arthritis and they got it down to this, psoriatic arthritis and all that. Nance said, what about Lyme disease? I said, what do you mean? What about Lyme disease? This causes inflammation in the joints and all that. Now, since then we've asked the doctors and again, like Ann says, there's tons of these doctors just don't accept it, don't want it, don't know it, don't need it, don't believe it or whatever. I mean, who knows? She, she is on a drug right now that is making her really good, really well. Thank God for that. Um, maybe it's masking Lyme still. Who knows, right? We don't know. I mean, who, who actually knows? They haven't tested her for that. So, yeah, it, it, uh, it's it, listen, if, if you're in the outdoors, uh, you needed to know about this. Yeah. Uh, don't use it uh, as anything but a positive. You know, it just uh, use it to enjoy the outdoors even more. Now that now that we've got this under our belt, I know personally now uh, I won't go trouncing around with my shorts and sandals on in in the woods, unprotected. Your Especially, ballet tutu? What's that? You're not gonna wear your ballet tutu out in the woods? Oh, <laughs> no, no. 
keep that indoors. <laughs> Especially in areas that are hot zones. And you can find these on uh, on the internet. Um, there are specific areas that are considered to be hot zones. And if you're in those areas, man, I tell you, you got to cover up. You got to take precautions. But even with those precautions, you got to check yourself out every yeah. single day. At the end of the day, there's got to be a routine and you got to check it out. It's like I said, you want to drop all the embarrassment genes out of your DNA. Uh, or or walk in the bush with the hottest girl ever or hottest guy ever, depending on what you, you like and prefer. And, you know, that might not be so bad. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, but I think I saw a tick 100 miles back there. <laughs> You're a beauty. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. So, anyway, just uh, be, uh, you know, be on guard. And uh, by the way, the area that I got uh, ticks in is the Long Sioux area, which has forever been a hot zone. Uh, the Ottawa area is another one, as is Windsor. So it's not just one particular part of of this province they're all over and uh, i think just about every province now including bc has had some form of reporting of uh ticks uh, lyme disease wow, eh? associated ticks so crazy it's, crazy be on the lookout so what do we got for uh questions well we don't know we can open it up now everybody to the yep. uh, the big old q a for that's the one <laughs> Q and A. Q and A time. Um, obviously, if you want to, we obviously Ant and I aren't good on Lyme disease. Ant's got quite a bit of knowledge, I, I guess, from through his uh, studying that. But if you want to break away to fishing, of course, right now we can get back uh, into fishing right now. Anything like that in the outdoors? Obviously, we're very happy with uh, answering questions on uh, fishing, et cetera. So, let me just deal with one that's right up there now. Chris uh, Gordon says it's getting bad in Redfrew County. Very bad. And yeah, if you look at hot zone maps, you'll see right now it it could be the center if you look it's at the it. Valley, right? The Ottawa Valley, yeah. right? So, yeah. That whole strip is just, I don't know why. I mean, really? who knows, right? But, well, but, I mean, there's a lot of woods in the area, right? There's a lot of woods yeah, yeah. along the highway. There's a lot of woods everywhere. Uh, yeah, yes and no. Not like that. I mean, you can't drive around Oshawa, south of Oshawa, and say there's lots of woods around. There's a bit of woods around, but. Do you know where I've not? heard of any incidences at all which surprises me uh and it's if you look at the maps it's not uh, uh in any of the hot zones is that whole kawartha area you know peterborough and, yeah. and to north north east yeah. and east, northwest nothing nothing yeah, at yeah, all. Right. Uh, good good point so i don't know what what that is but obviously these things are moving and being carried by animals deer right so Ken Johnson, uh, are they able to go through fibers of clothing? Well, uh, or if you wear uh, base liner shirts, which there is a great product, by the way, that I went out and bought right away after my my incident last year. And uh, it is after. a base layer <laughs> after, of course. <laughs> it's a base layer, and um, it um, it's almost like paper. But two things about it. Number one, very comfortable. You can get two piece top and bottom. Uh, you can get you can even get mitts, and you can get socks. So if you're overnighting in in tents and stuff, great idea to have something like that. But number one, extremely comfortable. Number two, extremely expensive. Those are the two things that I can tell you about both those products, and they're fantastic. Oh, look who's on today. The oh, what about Mash? What's that called? What do you say, that town? Yeah, but you're, you're, you're our French resident French uh, linguist here. Aren't Mas you? Masuche? Sure. Masuche. 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 Masuche Quebec? Uh, what about it? Well, my lovely wife, the Countess, she is in uh, Quebec as we speak. So, visiting my stepson. And you're going there tonight, aren't you? I'm leaving right after this show. Get the hell out of here. Up and I'm heading out there. Have some fun. Uh, uh, and and do a beer tonight? A couple of beers? You can have a couple of beers tonight or no? Am I going to have some beers tonight? Yeah, beer. Wait, wait. Wow, well, I don't see why I, uh, I don't see why I wouldn't. Okay, you good. Wouldn't. I might have I might have one or two. I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay, good. 
<laughs> um, Dan wants to know what's the biggest fish you guys caught. I do sooner or later we'd get off the bugs and get on the fish. <laughs> we got two but it's what we do, right? Yeah. Biggest fish you've caught in Rice Lake. I know exactly mine. If you want to think about yours, I yeah. got a, a, a 48 inch 27.77 pound musky on rice was my biggest fish and that was when i was quite a young lad um i told that story on one of these other live casts i'll quickly tell it again i got it right i was fishing smallmouth bass on the beautifully hump catching them on a crankbait and i saw a little weak crawfish crankbait and all of a sudden uh, by myself and i had my little bass boat a little 16 foot bass boat and thump and i thought i snagged a carp and, and all of a sudden and i didn't see it till it came because now it got dark i had to Turn the light on the boat, and they just saw this thing come beside my boat. It was 48 inches of muskie. Now, I've never seen a muskie before in my life. It's my first muskie ever. And it was 48 inches, almost 30 pounds. So that was, that was quite a story. That was, and it jumped. And then, and of course, as a kid, I was like 20 years old or whatever, like that. So quite young. I, I got it mounted. I brought the fish into the boat. I straddled it like I literally it was in the net going crazy and I straddled like a wrestling move you know to hold on to this fish don't you <laughs> that's my biggest race lake fish so no. you um, I wish I had a similar story but I think you know maybe my biggest fish caught on on rice would be like a five pound smallmouth maybe a five pounder but that's it oh you I got carp. you got 20 pound carp oh, oh, right. carp. oh see? see 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 how that just happened carp yeah. Absolutely right, yeah. but out of out of mind, right? Carp is always out right. of mind. So like it takes a backseat to everything. To, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great, great uh, carp fishery up there for sure. Rice Lake's a good lake. People that uh, haven't fished it, it's a good lake. So, without question, for me, uh, Tim, I think I've told you this before on the show. Um, Tim wants to know what's the best knot for tying braid to floral, keeping in mind small guides on a rod, especially keeping in mind small guides. For me, it's a knot called the Bob Foran knot. And it wasn't originally designed for that purpose. Uh, in fact, you have to cut a bunch of stuff off it after you're done with it because to make it work for, for tying on leader material. But it's a great knot. And uh, I think we have it. Did we not have it on the site, Pete? The Bob Ford knot? We did one on that. that the, I think we did one a while ago on uh on our tips or how to section, I think there's a knot piece there with that, with the foreign knot. Yeah, if you go to fishingcanada.com, I believe the how to section, and I think we have knot section. Type, type in foreign, F O R A N, foreign. And foreign. That, should, that should show you that it's, knot. It's, it's incredibly easy to use. Um, it's, it's, I still say it's the strongest knot that you can, you can get if, if tied properly. Mm -hmm. uh, Easy to use, very small profile, which is important for those small uh, rod uh, guides. Uh, but you can do it in the dark. Once you get the hang of it, and and you and you and you kind of get a, a rhythm going, you can do it in the dark. It's that easy to do, and it's called yeah. a foreign knot. So check it now out. Now the the uh, I did I did finally I think I told Ange to say successfully and finally tied an FG knot for the first time. I've been working on trying to tie an FG knot for a month now or two months now. And then just keep pulling it through and all that kind of stuff. The FG knot is thinner than a foreign knot, but it's longer than a foreign knot. Oh, it's, so long. it's a yeah. longer knot. It's, it's, a, it's all it is. It consists of the braid wrapped <laughs> around and around and around and around the single strand of mono now or, or floral. It works much better in my opinion so far, my experience so far, it works much better when the braid is quite small and the floral is quite big. So it, for some reason, if they're similar sizes. I can't tie it. I don't know why. I keep popping it out and pulling it apart. And I, because it's a bizarre knot, and you wouldn't believe it. Like It's not a knot. It's wrapping, and that's it. There are knots in the end of it to close it off uh, so it doesn't go through the guides too much or whatever like that. But it's just basically a bunch of cross wraps. It's a bizarre little knot. It's long, but when you tie it right, I'll tell you what, it's skinny and it, because I did use it, uh, I had a, about 20 or 25 pound floral to about a 10 pound braid. So a lot of difference in size to try it. Beautiful. It came through those guides, like it just slid through like nothing. So if you want to take the time to try and learn an FG knot, it'll take you a lot longer than what Angela's taught. Angela's knot will take you 30 seconds to tie. A four, yeah. An FG knot, if you're really good, it'll take you more than 30 seconds to tie. I'll guarantee you that about a minute to tie sort of thing. So. Wow, a little something you can you can think about if you want. But I was reading uh, uh, something a while back about this new um, 
and I, I'm not recommending this, by the way. I'm just, just telling you, you know, we're as as we become more technologically advanced in the fishing community, we're learning more and more um, things that we can bring over. <laughs> from, sorry, from, sorry uh, this, this uh, is freaking. <laughs> I don't, my wife wants to know, the Countess of Santa Stash wants to know, how do you get a husband to retire? There you go. Okay. She meant to say ha-ha. That's probably ha-ha in French there. Hi-hi. Maybe you can help her. Uh, just send in your comments. See if we can. Everybody. Go ahead. Sorry, Anne. But anyways, um, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to adapt more and more uh, technology from other industries. I mean, I, I don't know how many of you know it or not, but we owe – we owe um, the um, surgical community uh, a great debt of thank you because they gave us the monofilament line. You know, without them, we'd still be using Dacron or, or, or yeah. copper. I don't know what we'd be using. But, yeah. you know, those were originally used for sutures when sewing people right. up, the monofilament. Right. And then in the, in the late 50s, somebody started bringing it into – the fishing community. It wasn't until the 70s that it really became sort of mainstream uh, in fishing. Well, there's some new technology in that area now that um, has a chemical that chemically bonds two products together, like monofilament and floral. And I don't know about about uh, uh, braided, right. but certainly that other type of line they have a chemical now used in surgical procedures that it welds mono together interesting so you know maybe that's coming for us too right which would be great think about that just dip it in a dip it in a jar dip it in a jar boom time to get there touch them together and they're done wow could you imagine how okay how long would it take angelo viola because i know of pete bowman's answer to this one how long would it take angelo viola to trust that kind of knot you know what I mean? Not kind of bond, not knots, not a knot. So it would take you a lot of time, wouldn't it? You'd have to do a lot of testing, pulling against a tree, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Shock and absorption the whole nine yards, but how awesome would that be? Oh, it'd be great. It'd be great. And, and the reason that that I'm not, I'm usually leery about trying new knots, et cetera, you know, we spend all of this money and time on, on our equipment. You know, some guys up there probably got $1,000 rods, $1,000 reels, a uh, uh, $100 for a spool of line, like all this high-end stuff. And then they trust a knot because basically that's what you're doing. You're trusting a knot to, to – that's the difference between you and that that fish of a lifetime is that knot, right? And, and they don't spend enough time perfecting their knot and then tying it each and every time so it's 100%. They've got all the equipment. Right, right. there. What Angelo Viola said, folks, right there, tying it each and every time. So when you go home, you set the rod down, and then next weekend you're going fishing. Hey, I never even caught a fish on that thing. I use it a little bit, but I never caught it. You should retie that. Absolutely. Now, I lost a tank of a largemouth on the, exactly that. I know it was a six-pounder or, or more. I was on light line. It should not have broke, but because I didn't retie, I blamed it on because I didn't retie from the week before. I used it and never caught a fish on it, but I just know the air hit it, the way the water dried on it, whatever happened. Somehow, maybe it was sure. flawed. I lost a lifetime by not tie, retying. So Lazy. That's what yeah. we are. Lazy. Yeah. Oh, you got to get it out. Right there it is. It looks beautiful. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Calvin wants to know what's the deepest depth either of us have ever fished, and did you catch anything? You wanted to go first? Uh, I'm sure. I, I I believe mine would be about between two and three hundred feet for halibut and groundfish out in BC. Um, you got it. Yeah, oh, we definitely caught them. I mean, yeah, it's the it's the weirdest thing in the world dropping a pound and a half, whatever weight they are, like it's a ridiculous weight, and it goes all the way down, and you you don't even like. You just hold the rod in one spot, and the rod, the rocking of the boat is what gives the, the bait a little bit of action, or the, I guess a little bit to keep it off the bottom, because you know you're on the bottom part. Like, and then all of a sudden, you just feel some resistance, and, and the guide says, that's not bottom, pal. That's a fish. And you know, okay. Which are you? So 300 feet down on a, on a probably, what we use, like about a 100-pound test mono or something like that, Ange? Oh, yeah. It was 100-pound with, uh, with three-pound uh, uh, weight. Three pounds. Okay, yeah. And, and a chunk of uh, meat. meat, a chunk yeah. of fish. A chunk of fish. Um, on a great big jig. I remember how that, how impressed I was with the jig. It looked oh like a my God. It's the most <laughs> archaic looking stuff you'll ever use in fishing. But it we were we were at 380 feet at one point. Yeah. 
It caught fish. It caught fish. Yeah, that would be the <laughs> deepest. You know what, though? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, if, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm not big on deep water fishing. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, if I've got a fish more than 35, 40 feet, Eh, that's deep. That's deep for me. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of it. It's, yeah. it's really, the the fight is not there. Uh, of course, the problem with that type of fishing when you're in excess of 30, 35 feet is the chances of you performing, you know, live release on that fish is pretty much done. I, very, 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 very few fish will survive coming up that that deep. So over the years, we've just not. I haven't been a big fan of it. We we avoid it like the plague. Yeah, uh, we, I caught a laker once in Selwyn Lake in Saskatchewan. Ends at a uh, pike show in the Scallops. I went out for the for the lake road, and I did catch a laker in a hundred feet of water. I remember doing that on a on our old, old three way swivel poor man downrigger uh, deal like yeah. that. And that fish, they say that lake trout can burp their way up, and they don't get the bends in that. But that fish, when I brought it up to the surface, it turned over belly up. Yeah. A, a lake but it was a giant too and i uh, and i it did release perfectly it sat beside the boat nice and all that stuff but but even at 100 feet on a lake on a fish that's supposed to be able to decompress it was you know it was iffy on that one right so it's, yeah. it's deep. and it's not a good fight i i mean that's me uh all right the countess is really uh participating Ooh, she's on it today isn't she this is the first so she says i got the biggest knot marriage <laughs> It's working. Maybe I should learn how to fish. Then he'll get tired of taking me. Uh, 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 tired of talking, taking what? What's she trying to say? Taking me. I have no idea. Obviously, there's a little bit of wine flowing there in um, oh. the hey, with uh, Sebastian. It's kind of early, isn't it? Is yeah, it it's early. Quebec, in a, Quebec's in a different time zone, apparently. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> hour time zone. Uh, What's your favorite iCast product so far. I, I've been browsing a little bit, but I honestly don't know. Uh, I haven't really been up, Tony, on it. I know they've given a bunch of best in uh, class or, or whatever so far prizes out, but I haven't really been watching a whole lot. Um, I saw the I saw one thing today about Shimano put a new reel, a spinning reel out, and it's getting rave reviews. Um, other than that, I haven't really been up on like the baits. Normally, Ange and I are watching the baits not all the time, but this is such a different eye cast, right? Normally, Ange is at the eye cast, so when he's sending me information every day, oh, check this out, check that out, check the other out. So, it's been pretty bizarre. I don't know, maybe Tony's got a favorite he can tell us that he's, he's yeah, how about so you, Tony? What, uh, what have you got so far to report? Anybody that's been on the site, by the way, doing the eye cast live thing, uh, yeah, if you've got some information for us. Unfortunately, neither Pete or I have spent a lot of time on it this week. We both had yeah. other projects that uh, required we, got, we do know that uh, Garmin sort of took a step back because two years ago was live scope. Last year was the forest trolling water. But this year they did put a really cool one out. And it's very, it's, it's, a, it's an odd one. It's the perspective mode mount. So yeah. it's a mount for your Garmin live scope transducer, which just is as simple as it sounds, a little steel bracket that, that turns. As simple as it sounds. It opened up a whole new world. It screwed us over because we were just getting good in the regular live scope. Now we got to relearn this whole thing again. It's like, oh my God. I've, I've actually got a, a piece coming up on fishingcanada.com where I was uh, um, catching a fish using live scope. It's pretty cool. That should be coming out very soon. Hopefully, Mikey and the, and the boys will get it up very soon. But from seeing a, an image one way on your screen, now all of a sudden, shh, this is overhead view of another thing on your screen just by the simple flick of the bracket and the turn of the transducer and it just opens up a whole new world to us about 160 degrees or whatever it is i can't i don't even know how far out it is it's crazy and, and, and you know when i first heard of them doing this and, and seeing some of the imagery i thought wow somebody really screwed up here obviously the engineers when they first <laughs> developed this transducer were thinking like they weren't thinking properly because the way I can describe this bracket, and it's not that expensive a piece, is it, Pete? Hundred bucks. It's a hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Okay, so it's a hundred dollar bracket. But what it does? Think of it this way: the unit on its own, without this bracket, is giving you a sliver of a view. By turning it on its side, 
it covers the entire pie. That's how that's yeah. that's how I can describe it. So with with the unit itself, you're getting a sliver. Put it on this bracket. You just got the whole pie. It's that extraordinary. It is unbelievable. However, however don't knock down that sliver because that sliver goes on out 50 oh. or 60 feet or 70 feet way out there too. So. For sure. For sure. Uh, let me tell you, I know we're, uh, we are got off the track here a little bit because it was the, it was the ICAST question, but Garmin LiveScope has changed the way this guy and I are fishing now. And I'll tell you what, it is a game changer for anybody that first learns it and then uses it properly. It is crazy good. That's all I can say. It is crazy effective and good. So I'm listening to you and I'm saying, if I'm one of them, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, but they, they pay you millions of dollars to say that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you right now, without any concern whatsoever, if we were not partnered up with Garmin for whatever reason, and we've been with them for a few years now, if we were not partnered up with Garmin, we would still be using the product because oh, yeah. of their technology. We would be forced to use their product. Yeah. It's simple. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's an angler out there. I don't know if I mentioned it last weekend. Jacob Wheeler is the number one ranked bass fisherman in the world right now. And if you look on Jacob Wheeler's boat, he's got a Garmin unit, a Lawrence unit, and a Humminbird unit. He's got everything on it, all three. I saw it with my own eyes. So I guarantee he's using LiveScope for sure with a Garmin amongst whatever else he really likes with that. Then he's using these other ones for whatever else, for other reason too. So he's either he doesn't care about his sponsorship. Maybe he is sponsored. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say anything. I don't know. I saw it on his boat. There was three different units, all different companies. So maybe he's of our old friend Larry Allard. He used <laughs> yeah. to say, I don't want to get hooked up with anybody because I want to use the best of the best. Yeah. I think that's what he's doing, right? Yeah, yeah, could be, right. But, anyways, it, 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 go back to it very quickly. When you can't afford Garmin LiveScope, you've already got the units, buy it. Trust me. And wait till, yeah. the, wait till you see this video that comes out next week that I just, that, it'll prove oh. everything to you right there. This little oh. video I shot. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. Uh, Nathan uh, Hubbard. Hubbard. Why am I saying Hubbard? Oh, because uh, because because I've got people watching from Quebec. That's why. It'd be Hubbard then. Hubbard. Nathan Hubbard or <laughs> Hubbard, if you are so inclined. Uh, what spots on Sturgeon Lake would you guys fish for pickerel? Who? I, 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 I don't know Sturgeon very well at all. Like I really don't know that lake hardly at all you know what i mean so i couldn't really i i cannot give an accurate answer on that one oh, i i know a spot that is fantastic and the reason i know it's fantastic because i almost won a walleye tournament on that lake one year except for one small minor little detail i forgot that you have to weigh the fish in at the scales if the bag splits and they drop on the dock and go back in the lake you got to be kidding me. In. You got to be kidding me. That's where it happened. Was on I, never, I don't think I've heard this story. On oh, Lake. This, this is pre using nets under our bags. Yeah. We were yeah. using, there was no such thing as Berkeley live release bags or Shimano live release bags. It was whatever you got, plastic yeah. bag. And of course, walleye got these things sticking out. <laughs> They're like porcupines. <laughs> So I'll never forget, we had the best walleye day of our lives, Reno and I, on Sturgeon. I'll tell you about the pattern because it was fascinating. And we got it from an old local guy on the Friday before the uh, before the event. But anyways, so I've got, we never, we never, we don't know what the weight would have been. But, you know, the fish were, were in that four and a half, five pound average. Oh, for Sturgeon. Oh. God. For walleye on sturgeon, that was massive. Yeah, yeah. Massive. So, of course, I'm prouder than a peacock, right? And we had to, Reno and I had to arm wrestle to see who was going to go up and weigh them because we both wanted to weigh them, but they could only get one guy up there. Yeah. So, we, uh, so I, I won the flip or whatever. I can't remember. So, 
we, we're putting these things in and the, and the people are going, whoa, every time you put one in or whoa. And of course the bag magnifies them anyway. So you got, you got these massive wall. I looked like we were down in the Bay of Quinty for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got both hands and I'm picking it up off the, off the deck of the boat. And I go like this and take one step over to the dock and boom, the whole bag. Oh. And you got fish flopping. Of course, like I'm trying to grab. Oh, it was it was a nightmare. Oh, but anyway, God. so an interesting pattern on. Uh, and I'm assuming the whoever asked that question is fishing that lake. So, it's, uh, Mr. Hubbard. Yeah. So so um, there's an interesting pattern there when the mayfly hatch happens on that lake there. And if you look on the map, you'll see exactly where I'm talking about. There is a 38 foot hump. Pretty much in the middle of the lake, you know, the lake has got two long, three long arms. Well, if you look right sort of in that center area, you'll see a, an island. Actually, there's four islands, but the, the leading island to the north, there's a 38-foot depression in the lake. And apparently, it's mud. This 38-foot bowl is, is just thick mud, and it's where all of the mayfly or the biggest portion of the mayfly hatch happens on that lake and if you time it just right in which we did not because of our skills or anything because an old timer put us onto it those mayflies are coming up out of that 38 foot hump and halfway up there's a wall of walleye a whole armada of walleye that are just waiting for them to come up wow. and so we we used he told us to use black marabou jigs Yep. Uh, three eighths ounce black marabou jigs and get right on top of it and just drop them straight down and just and just drop it to the well, bottom. You're down 18 feet below the boat, halfway down, just hold, holding your jig there, waiting for them to eat it. Oh my god! Oh, so we were dropping it down and then just just bringing it up, eh? reeling it, slowly bringing it up. Yeah, said, looking like a hatch. He said, "Don't go jerking them around. Just just slowly bring it up until you hit that level, because the fish apparently we didn't know." And we certainly didn't have the technology to see back then down below the boat. But what he was saying is that those those fish do not go down to, to get those bugs. They wait till they come up. Yeah. And it's a whole, like, a, a whole wall of fish, walleye. And they're all sitting there just gorging on these flies as they're coming up off the bottom. So you, you drop your jig down and then just work it up to where they are. Oh, and my boom. God, I love that. Every time it was crazy. I love that. <laughs> did you did you guys do it again on day two or no? Did you try it again or did it was you a one day event? It was oh a one day event. god! Oh my god! Oh, we had it one. We had it one, and I got pissed off. I shouldn't have got pissed off because I got pissed off. Because, but you guys saw them. <laughs> you yeah, guys, yeah. There was yeah. an official on the dock, right? The yeah. Yeah. I said you guys saw them. Oh my god! <laughs> that, doesn't help. that doesn't count, pal. Wow. Oh, that's that was a fun. That's a cool. That's a cool pattern. I like. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine seeing that on your live scope right now? Putting that down there, you'd go nuts. You'd go insane. Yeah, you would, you'd see every fish. Would have a while. Uh, you, yeah. you guys right. fish for dollies at all? My dad tasted one and caught out of Kootenay Lake, and he swore it tasted like Atlantic salmon. I think dollies are great tasting too. I've never eaten dollies, but I caught my first last year. So, but you've you've done some dollies. You, you, last year, where? At, uh, at Ursus Camp, Steve and I oh, went over. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we went into a, a small lake, and uh, and and he had dollies in this lake. We went. We did a whole smorgasbord, and this one lake had rainbow trout and dolly barred trout. And yeah, uh, we, yeah, my uh, first one. We shot in uh, Revelstoke, BC, right. in that whole chain of lakes. I think it's called the Arrow Lakes. Um, yeah, we did. We did quite a bit of uh, dolly barred back a few years ago. They're great. They're cool. Very fish. cool fish. Very cool fish. The the uh, the bull trout is a dolly barred trout. Apparently, yeah. it's a migrating dolly barred. I think right. Yeah. Yep. Trout, That's what so. Say. yeah. So, but yeah, I've never tasted them. I'm sure they're good. I'm sure if it tastes like salmon, it'll be good. That's for sure. Because I love the salmon. You love them salmon, ain't good. Oh. Taste wise, yeah. What do we got, Michael? Uh, do you guys like to uh, center pin the Niagara River or do you like tributaries better? Hmm. I uh, don't think I've ever, I don't we, think I've ever fished the Niagara for steelhead, to be honest. No, neither, neither one of us, I think, have, have done that. I've fished brown, I've fished musky, I've fished carp. You got a lot of browns that one day. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You guys did. Um, yeah. But, so, uh, yeah. Oh, 
it's a great steelhead fishery, obviously. Uh, fantastic. But I think he's more interested in knowing whether we use center pin reels or not. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've used them a couple of times, but going back probably 15 years ago. When they first uh, came out. Yeah, like, when they first came out on the market, uh, I was intrigued by that whole center pin thing. Uh, we first started uh, using single action reels out on the West Coast for, for salmon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. those things they were the best oh, the I did not like that I get why the steelheaders do it here I don't get why those guys do it out there okay I'm not too sure about that one still to this day those knuckle bobsters I, I just uh, oh. I don't know I, they're a very good tool for these guys like who had ever put that question up there Nathan I think or was, who was it oh, anyway, I that question um, they are a very good tool for for the rivers here the steel hip removing water here but i don't know about that salt water stuff man <laughs> no salmon goes zipping off with that no. thing oh well, man you stand back you don't want to touch it <laughs> yeah your instinct is to try and slow it down you crack your knuckle about six times and go to the hospital later and you're done uh, Bert dev room uh is it best to put a few split shot on one heavyweight on the four, line four, or one heavyweight or one heavyweight um, I think I think um, hand on hand with the, the, conditions, the conditions will vary, you know, as to what I, I think if you're looking at um, current conditions and you want your bait to get down, but you still you, you don't want the current to influence its movement or its drift, then smaller profile split shot are definitely going to be better as opposed to one big one. But then there's times where, you know, you want to get to the bottom and there's no nonsense. Uh, you, you just want to get down there. And, and and it doesn't matter whether there's current or not. You just want to get down to the bottom. If it's finesse, I guess, would probably be the best way to put it. If it's something that's sort of a finesse fishery, then maybe uh, splitting it up. Certainly steelhead, you know, when you're when you're drifting roll bags or single eggs even on a little tiny 14 hook, um, yeah, <laughs> spread those spread little grains of sand on that line from from the float all the way down to yeah. to the hook but other than that you know i think most other presentations i don't think are quite as critical i could be wrong but that's yeah, certainly I, my experience i think you hit a nail on the head i think if you're fishing a lot of times for smallmouth or even walleye sometimes we got we use what we call a split shot rig and all that is is a split shot ahead of a nice small hook and you run a little finesse bait or even live bait behind it well, there, you just want one split shot. So you use whatever it takes to get down there. You, it's usually not deep because otherwise then you're running a Lindy rig or something with a deeper or the heavier sinker. But then you're, you know, so you're fishing bottom kind of a horizontal presentation. Then I think there's a bigger sinker. The biggest you can use to still get away with it is right. When the answer saying it's the vertical presentation, da, 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 that's the way to go with the small ones like that. So. And, and so much so in that presentation where you're, where you're running um, a float down a current area, and um, this this is you know the real the real avid steel headers years ago figured out that you know when you're drifting a row bag or more importantly when you're drifting a single egg, uh, it's sometimes you'll spook those fish with your float right. So so you want to set your your split shot down the line so that your your bait your single egg actually drifts a little bit ahead of the float. Rather than, than the float over top of the fish first, you want to reverse that. And that's where you start experimenting with various size and weights of split shot all the way down your line so yeah. that you get the, the very end of your line free flo floating a little bit more so than, than the float, which is really yeah. hard to do, by the way. In case you're yeah. wondering, in, in case what you're thinking I'm saying is easy, it ain't. Trust no. me. But no. there's guys out there who can figure it all out and they experiment and they change and they you know, put it out and they try until they get the float to be just a bit slower than their bait. Yeah. And that's, that's those guys you see hitting fish after fish after yep. fish. Yep. So. And they also mend their line like fly fishermen. Oh. So mending oh, line is they sure. flip that line so it goes behind the float. So there's the line, the float, and the bait like that. And they're very yeah. good at it. Very yeah. good at it. Yeah. Uh, Ava, uh, what would be your best tip for bass fishing in uh, oh, my favorite, one of my favorite lakes, but I'll tell you a story about that. Kuchiching. Um, she's heading up there tomorrow. Or he? Wow. Smallmouth or largemouth? Well, it's got both. You got to remember oh. that's it's got oh. both. And, and musky, too, by the way. Great musky fishing on Cooch. Well, that's too bad. 
Well, is too bad. <laughs> I'm joking. When you're bass fishing, those things are the last thing. When I'm bass fishing, get away from me. What does it matter with you things? Get away from my jig. I don't get, I don't get them. But um, it's, it's a fantastic lake. Cooch is a fantastic lake, right? Oh. Creek body water, no, and, I'll, and I and I'll give you. I'm going to throw out there a secret. I know anybody who fishes cooch a lot, bass anglers, especially the pros, are cringing right now at what I'm about to say. But uh, uh -oh. one of the best kept secrets on on cooch. But 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 hang on, maybe maybe I should think about this before I throw it out there. No, I'm going to throw it out there. But be responsible, okay? Be responsible. I know exactly where you're going. Does be it start with? Does it start with the, the best kept secrets are boats. The, yeah. the sailboats, the keeled boats that are moored offshore. Wow. Scary. Scary how good they are. Like frightening how good they are. Smallmouth. On sand, where where you know you've got six feet, four, six, eight feet, sand bottom, crystal clear water, and you got boats moored out there. Those boats, everyone, every single boat will have at least two or three fish under it. But be respectful. Don't go in there throwing rockets at those boats and clanging off the side of them and stuff. Because people are probably in those boats sleeping. They, they well, sleep. well, yeah, oh. they're in that too, right? They're going to come out and get pissed off with you. I'll give you a little tip too on sailboats before we get to Bill Deller's thing. You notice um, – when they're moored, like Anz was talking about, and they have a chain, usually it's tied to a tire, like the, the boat ties to this tire or whatever it is like that. That chain is a perfect weed ripper. Okay, what I mean by that is if you look under all these sailboats, even if it's a huge weed bed underneath, there's an open spot. It's just completely open, like that sand he was talking about, where, or, or somewhere where weeds can grow, but it's completely void of weeds. It's because that sailboat gets blown around all the time in circles, circles. That chain goes down to the bottom. And it just keeps ripping and ripping and ripping the weeds. So finally the weeds can't grow anymore. So you've now got a perfect little circle with a weed edge in it. A little tip for you too there. Why are we giving this stuff away? It just dawned on me. You should go to fishingcanada.com for more. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Why are we giving this stuff away? It only took us 50 years to figure this stuff out. <laughs> Ah, uh, big Bill, ball. Bill Deller. Okay, uh, here is a kind of uh, desperation question. I love desperation questions. Mm -hmm. uh, out fishing last night and Tuesday night, uh, Burford Lake here outside. Why are you, you know Burford Lake at all? No, no. Okay, uh, fish marking. Not one fish on or even a hit. Using everything, even live minnows. Oh my God! You know it's bad. You know it's bad when live minnows won't catch the bait. <laughs> oh. wow. wow! Yeah, that's a tough one, Bill. Go ahead. I'll tell you what, Bill? Number one, you have to, you have to really know your electronics. And I learned that this year again on something else. And I'll tell you the story. I went to a spot. My this is uh, probably the first time out this year. My buddies. My buddy was in a boat. I was in another boat. We didn't want to fish together. Pandemic, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I'm marking a ton of fish here, Pete. A ton of fish. You got to come on over here. Phone me on my, on my phone. I came over. And I had my traditional screen on my Garmin. And I looked, and I sure as hell, hooks, hooks, all kinds of hooks. And I went, wow. But then I went and I turned my... I turn my unit over to clear view, which is a downward shooting. This the, the, like the side view with the down view on on, uh, on Garmin. And that opened up a whole new world to me. And what I was seeing there, believe it or not, I'm not saying this is your situation, but what I'm saying I got fooled at first, and my buddy was totally fooled with this, is I start to see this coming up from the bottom, these, these lines coming up from the bottom. And what it was was air bubbles coming up from the bottom our traditional screens were only reading the top of the bubble at the time it was coming up, and it looked just like a fish. There wasn't one fish in that area, not one fish out of the hundreds of marks, but there was 100 bubbles coming up from the bottom. So first thing is trust your fish finder and know what you're looking at. Electronics are key in our fishing nowadays. In modern-day fishing, now that we have the tools to be able to figure stuff like that out, it's key. I'm not saying it wasn't fish. If it was fish, indeed, was it the species you were after? Was it suckers that don't want to eat anything? Was it any a, a subspecies of fish that don't know what you were fishing for? But it could be that too. You have to remember if it was if it was game fish like walleye or bass or whatever, and they're 
tanked up their good in the school, you're going to catch a couple of them. On minnows, if you're right in the wheelhouse, you're going to catch a couple of them. So maybe it's an odd species of fish too. A couple of guesses. I don't know. Ange, you got anything on that? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, we've all been faced with that situation. Uh, it, 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 uh, Frustrating is right. You know, you know, the one that comes to mind for me is, is, is the upper French River. When those massive schools of what, what we assume are walleye start congregating in the middle of that river at certain times. And it was funny because I was talking to Steve Nedzwicki just the other day about that very, very thing. Because he was, he's been up there with his kids fishing yeah. from Scottish. Yep. And, uh, he ran into them. He ran into that 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 massive, huge ball of he thinks they're walleye, and he and you know Steve knows that body of water really well. Uh, same thing. He says he spent most of the evening on them. Didn't get a bite. So I know that the boys there got onto that whitefish pattern, and in, in the case of the whitefish came up and did exactly that. Could that be whitefish you see him maybe instead he's of convinced that the what's he's talking about? In front of those little islands, yep. he's convinced that those are walleye. Wow. I don't know why, but the same huh. thing. He's been trying to catch them and just – and then and then they'll be gone. Like, and you wonder, how can anything that big, yep. that – like a mass that size, yeah. be gone? Yeah. How can it be gone? But. Yeah. So let's talk – I'm going to tell the audience very quickly about that because you brought up a great point in that – so the guys that work for Steve, the guides, the muskie guides, they were seeing all these fish uh, on the screen at first. They were wondering what the hell they were. They somehow, I don't know how, through evolution, found out they were whitefish. So these fish were uncatchable to the guys that were trying to catch these fish at first. But they discovered, holy crap, the muskies that were underneath these whitefish, that were feeding on these whitefish. So they started trolling through these whitefish schools and catching giant muskies. Yeah. So that was a frustration trip for them figuring out what it was and they can't catch these, but all of a sudden, Oh my God, the real deal is below these things eating them. So pretty cool. Yeah. Any experience on lower Buckhorn Lake? I love that place from uh, Ruben uh, Kincaid. Okay. Which one is lower and which one is upper? I always look at the map. The opposite. Backwards on the map or something. The opposite of what you think. Okay. So which one is Emerald Isle Marina on? That's lower. That's lower. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some experience on lower then, that's for sure. There's a, uh, I can't even remember Ruben's, I got so screwed up with it, I can't remember his question. Is there any advice on it? Is that what he said? Any advice? For what? I mean, we don't, I mean, I'm, we're, we're going to make an assumption that you're talking uh, bass. Uh, water will be hot through July and August in uh, shallower lakes. Any suggestions? So we're off that other question, Ruben? No, I think he's meaning that's, that's going to be the shallow water is going to be hotter in July and August. What would, what would you do? Let's take it as that. So that on that lake. He's talking about that. He's talking. Let's take it. He's talking about largemouth bass. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Um, two places or two patterns on that lake that work extremely well. One is anything that's floating, including um, there used to be some great undercut banks on that lake, but but years afterwards they kind of dissipated is very disappeared um so anything that's floating would, would be a uh, number one choice and and Great. tremendous weed beds on that lake like unbelievable big weed beds and and always bassin i mean obviously yeah. there's better weed beds than others i mean that lake is no different than any other body of water that that you're fishing and that is that it's got its ideal areas you know 95 percent of the fish are not going to be in 95% of the, of, of the lake. In fact, 95% of the fish are going to live in about a 10 or 15% area. So, and that lake is no different than any other lake. That rule applies everywhere. So when we say weeds or undercut banks, doesn't mean that every undercut bank or every, you know, weed bed is going to be ideal. But if you find undercut banks or floating mat and weed beds, that are situated in the ideal part of that lake, it's a gold mine. Absolute gold mine. I agree. Those mats, that overhead stuff Ange was talking about, look for it and oh. drop a jig or a craw or something through that. <laughs> Bingo. Crazy. Bingo. I love that. I love that lake. Love it's nice water. Lake. It's, 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 a, it's a nice type of I like that kind of water too, Ange. I, you have to oh. travel just a bit north. You don't have to go very far. You drive an hour north of the GTA or the 401, let's just say. And that type of water, those kind of lakes, you know, with some rock 
lots of weeds, lots of trees, and a bit of flats. And we, so I just love that kind of water. It's nice and clean, and it's just yeah. got every species going. It's fun to fish that stuff, right? Yeah. It really yeah. is. A little bit, little bit of traffic on the weekends, but yeah, hey. yeah, for sure, for sure. Ken Johnson, curious about advice for upcoming salmon run on the Ganny. Ganny. I use egg baits on a heavy spinning rod, but I have a heck of a time getting them to bite. Uh, every time I don't want to snag one, already preparing. Anytime I don't want to snag one. Um, well, first of all, I think I think uh, as as these fish. By the way, you know, fish do evolve. Believe it or not, and I and I can attest to that on a personal level. Bodies of water that you know you you couldn't make a mistake by throwing a, a white spinner bait and getting fish 10 years later you can't buy a fish with a white spinnerbait so i'm telling you this because even salmon even though they're cyclical fish and they've got you know that that life that lifespan of four or five six years whatever it happens to be in the great lakes and it does vary by the way and and a new breed is 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 put in there from a test tube and you're thinking well how can they evolve how can they how can they pick up they do they do so. So what I what I'm saying to you, what you were doing ten years ago, uh, drifting uh, row bags on that uh, body of water on that river, uh, has evolved too, and you need to evolve with it. Row bags are not the end all to be all. In fact, in the fall, if you talk to the real um, salmon drifting experts on freshwater, and by the way, that's totally different than West Coast salmon fishermen. Freshwater salmon fishermen, if you talk to any of them, they'll tell you right now that I think they probably stopped using a lot of row and row bags uh, a few years back because everybody's using them. So every single angler that goes there is drifting the same thing over and over. Well, those fish get accustomed. They get conditioned to knowing that that's not something they should be jumping over. Get a little different. A good friend of mine and a good friend of yours, too, Pete, probably one of the, the, the greatest steelhead river rats uh, in this part of the world, um, he, he wouldn't get caught dead throwing row or row bags anymore. He uses jigs, little tiny little 132nd ounce little jigs, you know, white or black, nothing elaborate, marabou. And he just goes in behind. Everybody's throwing eggs out there. He just goes in behind with his little marabou jig and just bounces. Boom, fish. Boom, fish. So sometimes you got to think um, about evolution and how you need to be a part of that evolution. And, and uh, salmon drifting is one of them. It's really become evolved. Good one. I like that. Good yeah. answer. Do either of you guys know of any great places for cottage rentals for a few days? Uh, it seems everyone uh, it seems everyone only will book for a week. Want to get away for a few days? Can't book a whole week. Yeah, I don't know about that one, and especially during this COVID now. I bet you, I bet you they're booking up even more. You know what I mean? People want to just get north and all that kind of stuff. I'm assuming maybe unless there's a different protocol out there, but I don't know of anybody that uh, that does two day rentals. Honestly. Uh oh, more countess stuff. Oh, Don wants to speak to the countess uh, in Quebec, I think, on this one. I lived in Lac Megan. Megan. Something like that. Uh, have you ever fished Lac Megantic? It's a fantastic fishery. Never heard of it. Never heard I'm, of it. I'm, Never not, heard of it. I'm not. going to Quebec. In fact, I'm going to go right now because we're going to call this thing quits for the day. Uh, I'll find out when I'm there. How's that, Don? <laughs> <laughs> we might be going to Quebec. Uh, Angela's been uh, talking to a guy, too, about a little Quebec fishing coming up. <laughs> Don't tell anybody yet, Angelo. Slow down, buddy. we oh. got intel going right now. We're all excited. So, uh, so uh, mon ami, we will do good there, uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we, we just got some great intel. Yeah. Uh, on a on a body of water in Quebec, and we're going to do some some. Uh, uh, we're going to do some sniffing. Yeah. See if it's real. If it's real, oh my God, we'll share. It for sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Anyways, we got to go. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us once again. Don't forget fishingcanada.com. Don't forget you need to uh, you need to um, enter. You need to win. Here, look there. There's some live bonus uh, codes on the screen right now. Tick muffin. 
That's you, buddy. The tip oh, no, no, they call me Muffin Ass. My, hey, oh. Muffin Ass. <laughs> uh, tip Muffin, in order to enter that, uh, that's for the boat motor and trailer giveaway. And it gets you 10 entries. <laughs> 10 tick muffin. entries. Tick muffin. I'm the Tick Muffin and you're the Chick Magnet. How's that? Okay. No, uh, Steve Labadee was the tick magnet. Oh, the tick magnet. That's right, too. You know, you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We will see you next Friday. Uh, you know what's on Fishing Canada tomorrow, by the way? Do we know what's on to Fishing Canada show tomorrow morning? Mikey uh, might have that queued up. I don't know if he does or not. But you know, uh, you know. I know. You know you got a fishing problem when you get out of a perfectly good warm bed to come out here and striper bass fishing. Those are powerful powerful animals, aren't they? The only way you can describe this thing is it's drop shotting on steroids. I've never seen anything rip braid off reel like that in my life. And so they get like how much bigger? Twice the size of that. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna kill you. Wow, is that exciting or is that exciting? Yeah, baby. Ah, what a great episode. Drop shotting with hooks this big. <laughs> It's going to be great. It's happening tomorrow on Global Television Network, coast to coast to coast, Canada's most watched fishing program, the Fishing Canada Show. And that one, uh, for a change, for a change, I'm actually in that episode. Well, if you wouldn't go having heart attacks and stuff, you'd be in more. Damn yeah. you. What's That's the matter smart. with you? I'll try and smart. Now I'm in the pandemic. You're going to come to Quebec with me. Yeah, true, eh? Every summer. you got an excuse. Viola, you got an excuse every summer, damn it. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm off to La Belle Provence. I will uh, report back to, uh, to you guys next week, next Friday. In the meantime, uh, stay safe. Get outside. Don't worry about those ticks we talked about. Just keep an eye on uh, on your buddy, the back of your buddy's knees. How's that? That's it. <laughs> don't look at his groin. Whatever you do, don't look at his groin area. Okay, that's it. Stay away. <laughs> See you later, guys. We'll talk to you next week. Ciao, everybody. <laughs>